have you had breakfast? Uh, yeah, we have them. Thanks. Um, what are you oh, saying, King Ray? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. the yeah. motel of some Ascot. sort. Yeah, Ascot <laughs> Motel. <laughs> um, there's only a few there, isn't there? Something? Yeah, that was alright. Wasn't so bad. Actually, quite nice. Mm. It's not expected. Mm. So that's a good thing. How's everyone? Pretty good. The gang's all here. Yeah. yeah. That's like walking onto uh, Universal Studios lot. Yeah. <laughs> feel very, uh, I don't know. Okay. I'm sure you're used to the camera. A necessity yeah. from your predecessors, to be frank. So which predecessor were those? Was it seven or nine that were here last? Because I saw what seven did, and I wouldn't be surprised if you seven. were. Nine's never interviewed. Oh, no, they did interview. Oh, no, they did interview. Nine's interviewed. You've got uh, Aubrey in, New South, in Victoria, New South Wales. Oh, okay. At Aubrey and Donald, but... They came here, but we weren't here. They came here, but we weren't here. Oh, all right. But yeah, I'm not, not all that surprised after having watched them. I would want some sort of documentation of what was going on as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing the amount of uh, lies that uh, seem to get perpetrated. What, did, what were you most upset about in the way that that shook out? Um, I'm not upset at all, to be honest. But I mean, what were you uh, disappointed by? What did you feel was untrue? I wasn't disappointed. <laughs> you can only be disappointed if you had an expectation that was different to what actually happened, and I didn't have an expectation that it would be any different. What makes you cautious then? It's not caution. Um, it's not caution, to be frank. It's more to do with truth. Like if, uh -huh. if the media can't be truthful in my interaction with them, then I'm going to be truthful in my interaction with the media mm -hmm. and then prove that I am being truthful through my own recordings of it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so it's not really a it's not really a caution really so much as a method of just ensuring the interaction remains truthful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least at some level. I know the media don't you know, they've all got their own Agendas generally, you guys have got your own agendas that I can feel, and and you know that's the way it is. That people have their own agendas, but most of the people in the media are not doing it for free. You know they're not they're not doing their journalistic things for free. They're doing it because they get paid, and and because they don't get paid, they're looking for an angle, and I'm aware of that. But but my intention is, if somebody does want to know the truth in the end then what I'll do is I'll make sure that there is at least some truth available about the interaction. Does that make sense? The beauty of, of recording it like we're recording it is there is some, at least some truth available about the interaction if anybody is really interested in knowing what really happened. Mm -hmm. And of course a lot of people are not interested in knowing what really happens. They're only interested in knowing the media's portrayal of what really happens. So, so for that reason, you know, I can't control that and I don't want to. But Channel 9 certainly has an uh, interesting relationship with the truth. <laughs> and then Matt, Matt nor I don't watch Channel 9 for that reason. Yeah. 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 Nor 7. Well, I feel, I, say, I, say, yeah. I feel that pretty much everyone has an interesting relationship with the truth. Most of the time people have decided what the truth is before they begin. And so therefore do not investigate thoroughly the thing. And, and you know, I feel for you guys because you know, living in an industry where everyone's trying to prevent you from discovering the truth, mm. pretty much, must in the end end up with a lot of, you know, like, like a lot of negative feelings about people generally, I would have thought, in the sense that, in the sense that, um, you know, you're always going to think there's some kind of hidden agenda, even if there's none. Uh, Actually, what, what I love so much about journalism is that it's given me the opportunity to meet so many people who've opened up oh, yeah. to yeah. us in ways that you would just never have an opportunity in any other job, you know? You yeah, and, that, and that are the, the truthful interactions are the ones that are the most powerful too, aren't they? That, yeah, that they are the most powerful both to watch and also to listen to or read yeah. about or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, no, we're actually quite lucky. Um, I mean, that's not to say I don't ever find my job frustrating. Uh, that would be untruthful. I yeah. certainly do. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, it drives you and uh, you continue. Yeah, well, there must be a lot of sort of uh, interactions where people are, um, 
you know, trying to hide the truth from you as well, mm. from what I can see. Anyway. Oh, Particularly if it was political in nature or yeah. things like that, you know. And yeah, you know, I understand where a lot of the media are coming from because they've had a life of people hiding the truth from them. So you know, mm. they always think that, uh, well, every media person, person that we've interacted with so far has always thought that there's some kind of, um, you know, there's some, there must be some kind of hidden agenda, you know. Can you understand why we would, assume, why we would think that? Um, I understand from, um, from what I observe in the world, certainly. Like, I can understand, um, you know, in the world that we live in, there are often hidden agendas. Mm -hmm. And particularly, the more sensationalist the claim, usually the more <laughs> hidden the agenda for many in many cases. And so, you know, from my perspective, I can, I can see why you may think that. Yeah, certainly. I don't necessarily agree that it's the way to find out the truth about something. You know, if you go into any interaction with a, a motive of, um, like, I'll, I'll turn this off. Yeah. I'm just trying to do my ironing before we go away again. We're yeah, yeah, yeah. Go away. And it's the only time I've had to do it. I, I need to leave it out if we can, so, so I can keep it. I'll just put that in the bedroom. Is there a seat for me somewhere? Leave it there. Take that picture of the old roaming around, sir. So okay, is it all right if I... Yeah, yeah. Please, please. Yeah. Sorry, you let me know. Andrew. Yeah, um, what was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> you can see why we went, uh, yeah, I can see why there is this underlying uh, motivation in the media to try to find something that may not be there or, or to come in with a preconceived notion that something must be there. And I suppose when I claim that I'm Jesus, um, most people automatically assume that that means I'm claiming a lot of things. So. You know, they automatically assume that it means that I'm claiming I'm God, and I'm not. They automatically assume that it means that I'm claiming that everybody should listen to me, and I don't. <laughs> In fact, I tell people quite a lot that, you know, they need to always analyse things through their own experience and through their own life. They need to... They need to have conviction within themselves yeah. about what, what yeah. they talk about and before they act on it. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. they're actually not in a truthful state themselves. So I, I encourage people to listen openly, but to not accept it just at, just at face value. Mm. Um, people automatically may think that I'm claiming that I'm better than them, which I'm not, because I don't believe I'm better than anyone, um, as Mary well knows. Uh, people automatically believe quite a lot of things as soon as I make that claim. And I, I feel a lot of that is based upon religious perception and you know, what people believe Jesus should be, and it's all to do with their own stuff, really, you know, mm. about Jesus. It's got nothing to do with who I really am or, or who I've ever been. Mm. Um, it's just got mostly to do with, you know, their own perception of what I should be through the Bible record, and not considering that the Bible record's been around for 2,000 years and obviously uh, has a lot of opportunities for it to change over those 2,000 years. And so they believe that those things must be true. And I don't believe a huge amount of people in Australia believe that anymore. But um, there is a definite Christian right that believe that. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, do you, I, right I with, Christian, do you think the Christian right has misinterpreted the teachings in the, in the Bible? Well, they haven't misinterpreted a lot of, they've misinterpreted perhaps some of the Bible. But they haven't misinterpreted a lot of it because the Bible itself is flawed. And if the Bible is flawed, then of course if you want to preach what the Bible teaches, then you're going to have to become as flawed as what the Bible is to preach it. And um, so, you know, this concept that God is a hateful, vengeful God who will punish the wicked, you know, that's not my experience of God, but, um, and it wasn't my experience of God in the first century, but, but if people want to believe that, that's up to them. But, but it's going to create a religion that becomes violent. It's going to become a religion that's punishing. And, you know, that's the reality of what it's become. So you can, you can, like, the average person on earth would not accept another person on earth treating them 
in the manner that the Bible says God treats people. Mm. Um, so that's where I have to disagree with the Christian right, in the sense that this belief, this belief in an angry, punishing God is one of the fundamental flaws of, uh, of religious belief on the planet, I feel. Um, yeah. Maybe it's good there to start back at the beginning so we can kind of work back to some of these more complicated sure. uh, theological aspects. Talk to me about your experience of being Jesus. How did this come about? When you were, when when did you first? Well, I've had memories of my life um, in the spirit world and in the first century through my life, but I never, I never believed that I could resolve them in the sense of what they meant. So, so I lived my life generally as most probably normal people live their life you know I had businesses and um, you know I went to college and got some qualifications and had a business and um, what kind of business oh I had a number of businesses you know I was in computer in computing mostly um, I had a computer business called expert computer solutions and um, where where we supported you know usually what you'd call middle tier companies or, or government departments. And then I also started a property development business because I wanted to try and get out of computing. And so I did all of those things. Still having these experiences that I had without really giving them much credence, I suppose. How did they, when you describe these experiences, what do you mean experiences and how? Well, I had memories of someone nailing nails through my feet, for example, or through my, just, just above, the ankle, just below the ankle of my feet, um, which I never understood, um, and I never put much store in, to be frank. Um, when you say memory, do you mean uh, in a dream, or you'd be walking around and all of a sudden you think, huh, like, like I remember driving up here yesterday? Or, or like I remember maybe something in my childhood. Yeah, it's not like that. It's more, if you can imagine remembering something in your childhood that's been traumatic to you, mm -hmm. um, usually it will be accompanied with a lot of emotion, uh, crying, fear, whatever. So when I had these memories, even all through my life, um, they were always accompanied with those kind of emotions. So. They were never like, oh, I remember this now, isn't that wonderful type of feeling. Sure. Um, it was more the opposite to that, which is one reason why I didn't desire to remember much more, to be honest, mm -hmm. because it always became some kind of an emotional experience that I, that I personally felt that I couldn't cope with at the time. And I personally had no desire to fully investigate either, to be, to be honest. And, you know, I really wanted to, particularly once I got my property business is going and um, I really felt my life was becoming comfortable and I was enjoying my life a lot more I had a bit more free time to myself uh, instead of just working all the time and uh, I felt that I was getting my life nice and comfortable <laughs> and not having too much emotional uh, or any emotional issues and um, yes yeah, so I felt pretty good um, Where were you living at the time? I was living down in South Australia, um, yeah, in a little ca a country town there, Victor Harbour, just a beautiful seaside town in, in about an hour away from Adelaide. And yeah, I just really enjoyed my life, actually. Um, had no desire to discover what any of these memories that I've had in the past or experiences that I had in the past actually meant. Um, and. Then I just had a series of uh, things that happened in my personal life, like in terms of um, I was still sort of seeking a decent, what I felt would be a decent relationship, and I didn't, I wasn't with anybody, and and then a series of events that occurred caused me to um, just start again connecting with these same kind of memories again, and and this time instead of being resistive to you know, discovering what they're all about, I decided to to try to discover what they're all about rather than ignore them anymore. Mm. And in the process, how old would you have been? Um, well, I started the process of working my way through some of them when I was about thirty-three or thirty-four years of age. 
The memories uh, without the context. Then. Yeah, well, memories without context. So you know, the memory of me having nails through my feet has been with me all of my life. Um, and so that was one of the memories I just allowed myself to experience emotionally. I didn't, even after I experienced it emotionally, I didn't, um, I still didn't have any context for it um, because obviously I didn't want to have other experiences that were similar um, in terms of memory, re remembering them. But as time went on, by the time I hit 40, um, these memories and experiences I, w I was used to having and also able to emotionally accept and then I went through this big process in when I was around 40 that was again an emotional process with regard to truth and that I realized all these truths that I've sort of been with me all of my life that I've never really discussed with anybody or allowed myself even to investigate either and I finished up just writing down right writing it all down but over a period of many weeks. I was still doing my businesses, um, so it was in amongst all of that. Um, and then I decided it was, it was too an, emotion, an emotional experience for me to continue doing my businesses. So what I decided to do was to stop my businesses and just sell off the properties that I had accumulated just to survive. And then what I'd do is I'd focus all of my energy and time on just resolving what, and putting a context to what these memories were all about. Um, so over the next, from, from the time I was 40 on, onwards around about, uh, 41 I think it might have been, um, I just did that. I just uh, put, tried to put a context to, and I, when I say try to, I wasn't very invested in any context. I was just trying to find out why I was having all these experiences basically. And so what did you do to try to find that out? Well, the first thing I did was allowed myself to have them. Up until that point in time, I was very shut down to having them. And in fact, uh, there'd been a couple of events in my life where I was so shut down to having them that I would um, that I would try to shut them down a lot and finish up getting quite sick uh, in the sense of quite, you know, physically sick. Like, you know, I'd get flu symptoms and then I'd stay sick for weeks and just trying to shut down the actual experience. But once I started, I realised when I was in, in my mid-30s that... I started to see this uh, pattern between shutting down emotion and getting sick. I used to get sick a lot up until I was 34 years of age. So when I say a lot, I'd be sick every month with a flu or a cold or something every single month. And I've been like that right from my childhood. So I've been a very, very sickly person. And, then, and, and I started realizing in my mid thirties that there was a relationship between the suppression of emotion and the sicknesses that I was having. Because what I noticed was when I did not suppress the emotion, even, if, even though I had no context of the emotion, as long as I did not suppress it and just allowed it to flow out of me, I didn't get sick. So, so when I was about 34, I stopped getting sick. And it's very, very rare for me. I think I've been sick once or twice since. Um, and every single time it's been because I've tried to shut something down again. Um, so, so I realized that um, that my sicknesses of my childhood and my early adult life were all surrounding my suppression of this emotion that was obviously in me, trying to get out, and I was trying to keep it under all the time. And I feel that the average person on the planet's got a lot of emotion that they do the same with, to be honest. That's why we get sick. And I firmly believe that's why everybody on the planet gets sick, is because of the suppression of emotion. Once you allow the emotion to flow in a, in a loving way, in other words, you allow it to experience the emotion, you just don't get sick anymore. Do you think that that's the case with all illnesses, bacterial and... and um, yeah, you know, the, the reality is in our body, in your body right now, there are literally thousands of bacterial organisms that are anti your body, that are willing to attack your body. There are inside of your body millions of viruses right now, and your body manages the, to combat them on a daily basis through processes, through physiological processes, and and you don't even think about it. You only think about it when you get sick. Mm. You know what I mean? So, so the reality is, each person is carrying around inside of them all of these means for sicknesses, but without getting sick, because the majority of time our body is capable of fighting off and, and preventing these particular illnesses from occurring. 
do you see that as an original uh, sin kind of thing, or do you think it's something that people build up over their lifetime that they shut down to emotion because of societal pressures or the like? Yeah, there is no such thing as original sin, aside from perhaps, uh, if, you, if you call sin missing the mark of love, I believe there was a first human couple, because I've actually spoken to them, but um, the, the, their uh, emotion was one of wanting to be self-reliant, and I feel that that was the, if you were going to call anything an original sin, that was their original desire to walk away from love by becoming self-reliant and trying to live without God, basically that's how they explain it. But, but I don't believe that uh, our sicknesses and disease are a result of that act, but rather they are the result of our suppression of emotions that we have, that are, that are inside of us, that through, as you say, through societal pressure and other pressures, uh, we don't allow ourselves to experience except under extreme circumstances. Um, but then why would uh, pre-verbal, for example, children get sick and die? They get sick because of what happens with their parents and what happens with spirits. Um, we are surrounded by living people who we can't see and we are also surrounded, the, the child is surrounded by the parent's suppression of emotion. And the child automatically begins to absorb the parent's suppression of emotion. In other words, whatever the parent is attempting to suppress in themselves, the child will also either attempt to suppress in themselves or rebel against. So you think that if a, if a child gets sick and dies, it's the fault of the parents for not dealing with their well, emotional trauma? When you say fault, no. I can, or, or it's caused by the parents not dealing with their emotional trauma. It's not trauma. just caused by the parents not dealing with their emotional trauma. If you look at the true cause, it's caused by why are the parents not dealing with their emotional trauma? The reason why was because their parents didn't deal with their emotional trauma and society, while they were growing up, didn't allow them to deal with their emotional trauma and all of those kind of things. So if you really want to trace back the true causes, it, it's far more widespread than just the parents and their actions towards the child. That's the reality. And then if you look at every single person who dies and passes into the spirit world, every single one of those people, majority of them, are still trying to suppress emotion and they often, they often overcloak or, or affect what's happening with the child. So a lot of child onset diseases, for example, where the child gets a disease and dies, is actually caused by, historically, some parent, uh, some grandparent or in the lineage who has become a spirit, overcloaking the child, influencing the child through their own emotional suppression. The child, children are very sensitive to that. Most children can see them as well as, and this is what they call their imaginary friends. You know, we call them their imaginary friends, but the reality is that people they can see and people that they can interact with and people who are suppressing their emotions uh, just as much or often more than their own parents are. So you can't say that it's just the parents. It's parents associated with the general uh, environmental belief systems, even the medical profession contributes to, to the suppression of emotions by, by giving us pills when we need to feel emotion. Um, there's societal pressure to not feel emotions. Like any time somebody cries in public, everybody gets distressed, everybody worries for them, you know, and instead of just letting them have a good cry and get it out of their system. Uh, then we look at what governments do and we look what religions do and, and if you look at the entire society it's all most of it is about the suppression of some kind of emotion or desire and and if you analyze all that and put that together that's the pressure the child is under and this is why children get sick regularly when when they're first born and it's also why many children get sick and die when they when they're a child because they are the most sensitive of all of us to all of these pressures as we become adults, we become less sensitive to those pressures and so we become more of ourselves, we have more of a sense of ourselves and we also uh, have a tendency to absorb all of these pressures and become a part of them. Um, and so we end up being a part of the same pressures ourselves and we begin to put that pressure on our own children and, and on the society as well. And so, yeah, I, I would say that we all contribute to the sickness and death of a child, mm -hmm. to be frank. That's what I would say, we all contribute. We are all right now contributing to the sickness and death and war and all the other things that are happening on the earth through some of our own emotions mm -hmm. and that we are suppressing, that we are trying to stay away from. 
you know, for, for example, if you look at the Western world, we are attempting to suppress the emotions that cause us to have greed. Our greed causes us to go to other countries that are less powerful than us and rape those countries of their resources to support our greed. So if we dealt with the emotions of our own greed, you can see that we may not go to those countries and do the things that we would normally do. So there is a direct relationship between the emotion I have of wanting more and the result in another country. Well, I'm sorry, I'm confused. We're, because we're suppressing the emotion of greed, but wouldn't it be, wouldn't these invasions to get more resources be releasing the, that greed? I mean, no, we're, that greed? what we're doing by invading the country is that we are pandering to the addiction of greed. We're not actually just sitting down and feeling the emotion of it and feeling how bad it is and how unloving it is towards others. We are pandering to it. We, we are actually addicted to satisfying it. And it's the addiction to satisfying an emotion that causes us to go and do something that's unloving. So does that make sense? Sure. Sort of, yeah, that's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. So, sorry, getting back to it, you were about 40 and you start pursuing codifying this to some set extent. You had, you know... Yeah, so let's get back to that. Yeah. And so, so I'm going through this experience and, and then all of a sudden I have see these memories of why I have uh, had these memories of nails in my feet and, and many of the other experiences that I've had. And, and they were all memories about who I was. Now that was a very difficult time of my life actually to, to because I, you know, I felt I was going crazy. I felt it was, it, um, that it couldn't be possible. My belief system that I, I did not believe in, in anything to do like with things like reincarnation or, in fact, I was totally against it as a belief, to be honest. Um, I had no uh, concept of how it could have happened, um, except the concept of how it happened came to me immediately after. So, so in other words, I, I knew exactly how it happened, but I could not emotionally accept how it happened, if that makes sense. And so I went through a very emotional process where I was alone for a long period of time, uh, nearly nine months or so, uh, where I didn't do much other than just deal with uh, how I was feeling. And once I started to just sort of emotionally settle with it all, that's when I first told my children, my two boys, that uh, what I was going through. So I didn't, didn't even discuss with anybody what I was going through during that time. It just felt to me to be far out, way out there, too way out there to discuss with anybody uh, and still maintain uh, some semblance of control, of, of not so much control, but some semblance of happiness in my own life. You know. Did you consider at that time see, seeking professional psychiatric help? Well, I'd sought uh, professional help previously for some of the experiences and I hadn't found it very effective, to be honest. Um, they, they were trying to tell me that I'd had some kind of childhood trauma that involved somebody nailing, uh, you know, nails into my feet, and 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 yet I did not have the scars of such things. Um, they, I started to actually believe that I'd been somehow assaulted when I was a child, but you know I talked to my parents about that, and and I couldn't see how that could have happened. Um, given given the circumstances and situation we're in, and so I really didn't understand. Uh, well, you know, they they attempted to help me emotionally, which was great. So you know, they allowed me to experience the emotion of it, because they believed that um, all the emotions came from some kind of event that caused me to have such things. Um, but uh, but. Um, the event never got resolved, you know, like because I because I couldn't put logically the event with a thing, with you know the actual memory, if you like, of the event with an actual occurrence that occurred in this life, and that that was that was my difficulty, and so I by the time and then after a while, after a couple of years uh, of uh, occasionally seeing them, um, and in fact I saw I finished up I finished up seeing a psychologist for probably uh, two or three months right at the beginning when I started to face these when I was about 33 or 34, and eventually he really couldn't help me because he because I kept saying to him well, what I'm saying to you well, you know where's the context of that mm. to that particular thing, and and instead he just said well I've got this friend who 
uh, who, who um, just helps people go through these emotions. Uh, and I, so I finished up contacting this guy who, who um, help, helped me, I used to see him once a week for a period of time, who helped me actually get used to going through the emotions, mm -hmm. just letting myself have them. So by the time I was in my 40s, I, I was able to do that myself. I didn't need any help to do it. I was completely, I didn't feel overwhelmed by the experience in the sense of, um, you know, I didn't feel like I was breaking down or, you know, I still did my business. I was still, you know, I still paid my debts. Uh, you know, I had my normal life. I still went shopping. I still did everything else, interacted with people if they, if they wanted those interactions. But, uh, but I did spend a fair bit of my time alone just allowing myself to feel those feelings. But I wasn't stressed out about it in the sense of worried that I was having them now by that stage because they were just a normal part of my life. Did you seek anyone out about your identity? No, not during that time. No, no, I didn't seek anybody to confirm anything or deny anything. Or, um, yeah, but I, you know, once I told my boys and I told my mother, my mother went to a psychologist again and was all worried about. And the psychologist said, "Oh, look, I'm probably suicidal and all these kind of things," which I wasn't. <laughs> and um, and I'd probably harm myself and others, which I which I didn't. And I'm probably not, you know, have she checked out my house, is it clean and tidy, can I look after myself, which obviously I could. Um, and, you know, she, you know, so she, she went along with all of that, with the psychologist for a while, uh, and for a period probably of six months, and then after six months she checked me out still and everything. I was just as normal as I've ever been with her, and so she just gave up that as a idea and it was only she didn't even tell me she did that uh, she only told me that sort of three months up well she didn't even tell me actually I, I went to a because I still had properties I needed insurance and I went to I had to go to doctors to have physical checkups all the time to get insurance because uh, um, because of the amount of insurance I was looking for and 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 the doctor pulled out a report that my mother had written and that was the first time I actually knew that my mother had even done that um, so I discussed that with my mother and she broke down and cried and told me all of the reasons for doing so. And, but at the end of the day she knew I wasn't crazy and she still knows that I'm not. So, um, and what, if, what about your boys? How do they feel about it? Yeah, they're fine. Completely yeah. fine with it actually. They, they have always felt from me a strong desire for God and for truth and for love. Um, they've always felt that I'm pretty grounded. So. Yeah, like, you know, we have great friend. I have a great friendship with my boys. Um, How old are they now? Uh, the eldest is 28 and the youngest 26. And what do they do? And the eldest is a social worker um, and the youngest... He's a youth is, worker, actually. Uh, sorry, a youth worker, but it's a social worker. And the youngest is a... Um, he's, he's at uni doing degrees for music production and... Uh, uh, yeah, so he's he's doing a. Uh, what are you doing? A uh, yeah, he's doing a master's, a in, master's music production. in music production. In music production. Yeah. yeah. Does it? Um, sorry, I just have to break these up into edible chunks. So I'm gonna start again. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna just get you know six hour yeah, yeah, long yeah. recording. And then you don't know where to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you sit there and I get very uh, stressed <laughs> out. Um, so does it upset you that, or you know, is it sad for you that your sons? aren't with you here, that your sons aren't involved in what you're doing, that you have other people who are quite, you know, devoted to what you're talking about, what you're teaching, but your sons don't? Well, actually, how do you know that? Do you know that? Right. Well, that you said they're not here, I mean, that they're in... in well, no, they live in different places, but I, I'm not heavily invested in my son's lives as people... I'm not heavily invested in anybody's life as people imagine. You know, as soon as I, as soon as I say I'm Jesus, people make a lot of assumptions, right? And you've made a lot. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a packed, it's a packed uh, name. If you said that you were, you know, a, uh, you worked as a uh, sailor on a ship in the 15th century Spanish Armada, <laughs> but I'd say well, you could be anybody. You, know, you could say anything. Well, what about if I just said I'm, I'm AJ Miller teaching divine truth to the world? By now, I'd already be famous, to be frank. Like yeah, because I mean, of what I'm teaching, most people would listen to it. The reality is actually that the majority of people don't listen to me because I'm saying I'm Jesus. That's yeah. the reality. And I understand why, because they initially feel, they hear me say that, and then they make a heap of assumptions. 
about me that have no idea about. What are, what are the wrong assumptions that people make? Uh, well, the assumption that my children don't have much to do with me is an assumption. They're not, not to do with you, to do with, uh, you know, God's will. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that's not true either. But um, that's an assumption, right? Um, there's also an assumption, there's assumptions such as I'm saying that I'm God. That's an assumption, because I'm not. I've never said I'm God. There's the assumption that we take money from people uh, ruthlessly and regardlessly of their well-being. Yeah, and that's an assumption. Yeah. There's an assumption that I'm using my, the name of Jesus as a desire for a position of power, and that's an assumption. Assumption that um, I'm, you know, I could probably list hundreds of them, to be frank. I think sometimes sometimes those assumptions are true, though, aren't they? Sometimes we assume, I mean, I think you probably assumed, like you said, when we came here, that I had an agenda of some sort. No, I know you do. There's a difference between a knowledge and an assumption. A knowledge is based on what you've already told me. An assumption is based on what you believe about somebody that they've not told you and you haven't investigated yourself. So what's my agenda? Well, I believe your agenda is to sell papers. But I don't care if I sell papers or not. No, but if, you, kind of, but um, if you don't, then no, you, nobody hears you. How do you, li- how do you live? I get paid regardless, whether whether it sells two copies or a million copies. Really? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. But is that is that really realistic? Yeah, I think so. I mean, some of the so if you continually every one of your articles only sold two copies for the rest of your life, do you think you'd still be employed as a journalist? Well, yeah, because I mean, it's connected with you know, I'm in in a magazine in this issue, for example. Your story will be together with six other stories, you know, three other feature stories and four or five dispatches in a magazine that is, you know, sold in a Fairfax paper, which frankly, Fairfax doesn't sell very many papers anyway. Um, so yeah, there'd be no way to prove that it was my bad article that, that but did where that. does the money come from? Uh, Gina Reinhardt. I mean, Fairfax, <laughs> the Fairfax board, I mean... Uh, yeah, but where do, they get, really where do they get their money from? Well, their own... I mean, with, with Fairfax, for example, it's, you know, Fairfax has been losing... I understand. Money. So, the, so a lot of the money comes from, well, obviously from the shareholders, and then it comes from the board if they inject money in and buy shares. But where does it really come from? Doesn't it come from advertising? Not anymore. That's the problem with the newspaper business is that nobody makes money from advertising anymore. They're I, all understand. Trying to find I understand that's what it is now, but isn't the entire reason for, for a newspaper industry to survive in this particular environment that it currently is in is all about having some kind of exposure otherwise people won't read the paper not anymore i mean it's, it's more of a holistic approach and and you know it's an interesting time for journalism i mean things oh, i agree are, are well changing. particularly written journalists I agree. yeah and yeah. it's very different to the the you know the, the previous iterations we've had of course have been with you know a lot of television media and their their agendas are very very uh <laughs> yeah. blatant, blatant yeah, like, yeah, obvious and also, they, they have no, um, uh, what would you say, they, they have no resistance to actually stating in, in, in frank conversation that, of what their agenda really is. Right? Yeah, of course not. But let's, if I look at each person's agenda, generally, you know, you're doing a story with me because I'm saying I'm Jesus. Do you, do you, you can see that, can't you? Oh, yeah, of course. If I, was saying, if I was saying that I'm Alan John Miller and I had no... no um, notoriety, then it's highly unlikely you'd be doing the story. I might. I just think it's interesting. <laughs> I, frankly, you know, and I'm being. You know, well, totally no, I mean, if, I life. mean, if all of these different things weren't happening around me, you wouldn't be doing the story. Well, yeah. I mean, if you weren't. Like if I was average Joe Blow on the street, and I feel I am the average Joe Blow on the street. That's the irony of this, right? But but if you perceived I was then you probably wouldn't be that interested in a story. It's because of the perception you have that I'm not mm. that causes you to want to do the story. Sure, but that's not an agenda, that's just interest. Um, no, I, I feel that's a perception in itself. Like, I am the average Joe Blow. <laughs> but you also story. say you're Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus is the average Joe Blow. But he was the son of God, wasn't he? No, see how you're putting another assumption. Like I said in the first century and now, that everyone is the son of God. You are a son of God. Mary is a daughter of God, and I am a son of God. I'm not the only one. No, but you are a specific and quite famous one. I, of course, I am a specific and quite famous one. But uh, but how much of that fame has come from people actually knowing me, or actually reading a Bible account about me? It's sort of a bit, it's a bit like 
what I see has happened with regard to the issue of Jesus is this. It's, a, it's very similar to the issue of a person who's become famous in modern times, and that is a lot of things are said about them that are not necessarily true, as you know. Sure. Right? And, and yet everybody believes they're true, or they always believe there must be fire there because there's smoke. You know, that's the underlying thing. But, but the reality is media, the media in the past with us has created all the smoke. So it's sort of like creating a whole heap of smoke that then people believe there's fire in it, that there's no, and, but they purposefully did that. And, and they did that for a reason. And there's their agenda. Why do they want to do that? Well, one of the reasons is because people feel that they should be afraid of me. Well, why do they feel they should be afraid of a guy who talks about, who lives in a two bedroom home in the middle of the bush in the Queensland, who, who only goes wherever he's invited to go. He never forces anybody, any information upon anybody. He tells everybody they have free will and have the ability to make and decide for their own lives. He's preaching about God and he's preaching about love and he's preaching about truth and he's preaching about remaining humble. And why would anybody ever be afraid of such a person? Do you think it's a context? I mean, we've seen, I think people have a very hard time in general. The reason we, you know, we create perceptions I, of things is I people agree. want to look. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, if I have, this is a table, and I know that because I have a table at home, and I eat on that, and I saw another table there. Exactly. Guy claims he's Jesus. Well, I, I have a perception because of the Branch Davidians or because of exactly. something else, exactly. so they must be a cult. So what we finish up doing is we finish up judging the current situation mm -hmm. through a series of situations that have already occurred. Sure. Of and that's, that's a fairly normal thing to do, I agree. Mm -hmm. right? I'm not saying, though, that it's right. I'm just saying that it's normal, mm -hmm. like most people do it. And the reality is, just because I'm saying I'm Jesus, people then believe that I have a whole heap of agendas that I do not have. Just because the other people who have said they're Jesus, or other people famous, or other people who have tried to lead cults or whatever they've done, because I don't actually have a cult. Like a cult is a, a thing where you can force a group of rules upon a group of people, and I don't enforce any rules upon anybody, and nobody actually lives here. There's no compound. There's no, you know. So, so the reality is quite different to what's being said about us, and and then I got a question. Well, why are these things being said when? when none of it's true, and that is because people want to maintain the fiction because it's more interesting <laughs> to them, generally, than the fact. Uh, sometimes, so you know. Maybe some people are, especially people with direct connection to people who are uh, you know, involved with, with what you're talking about, yep. their families may be concerned because they, the context of them is, oh, look, everyone's saying this is a cult, the guy says he's Jesus, by all accounts, I'm sure you can understand why somebody would, their initial reaction would be, guy's probably not Jesus, maybe he has an agenda. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, I know, completely understand yeah. that. So but, it doesn't but, mean that they're right. Doesn't no, it doesn't right. mean they're right. I'm not saying that it does, but can you see why maybe... I'm not saying people agenda, shouldn't be concerned. About their families? Oh yeah, no, they should be concerned. If a, if a person loves somebody, they will naturally want to tell their family the truth if they feel a certain truth. But, but they need to make sure they've investigated before they actually say the, what they believe the truth. Most people are only saying, and this, most people are only saying to their families what the media has already told them, which is all a lie. And then, of course, the the family that they're concerned in go, no, I can't agree with that. And the, and then the people say, but but the media have said this, so it must be true. You're obviously and the, brainwashed. You're obviously brainwashed. And the and the guy's saying, no, no, I've had my own experience, and it's not like that at all. And the family then feels like now now they've got a problem. Well, of course they've got a problem. They're not listening <laughs> to the personal experience of the person who's actually investigated to find out the truth. Don't you think that most people who, if they were involved in a cult, would say, and they have been brainwashed, would say, I haven't been brainwashed, I'm not in a cult? Isn't it kind of hard? So how do we it's solve the problem of brain, brain brainwashing? It's yeah, but can you, can you see the illogical yeah. reasoning that you've just presented, though? No. Because it's like saying, logical. how can you prove something you? that never, never happened? <laughs> How can you prove that something never happened? You can't. It's, it, it's a, exactly. You can't prove a, disprove a negative. <laughs> exactly. Right. And that's what you're really the question you're asking. How can I disprove a negative? I can't. I can't disprove it. All I suggest to a person is listen to the material. You know, if they want to get to know us, they, anybody's got the opportunity, as you've seen. 
to get to know us. You know, there's people who've come from the public who've just interviewed me, who've never seen me before. Sure. Everyone has the opportunity to know us within the scope of our time, of course. Mm. And, and so they can find out whether we're like that or not. And if they want to believe they're like that, that's I think fine. you misunderstood my question. I'm not saying is that correct, um, that, you know, because some people are, anyone in a cult would say they're brainwashed, that you're, I'm saying that the people in, you know, who are here with you are brainwashed. That wasn't what I was saying. I'm trying to gauge, I but guess, But that's what you're assuming, much, isn't it? No, no, not really. I mean, you're assuming there must be. Because I, they, they are listening to a guy who's saying he's Jesus, whereas the average person wouldn't. I don't think that they're brainwashed, <laughs> what per is se. It I don't know. That's what I'm here for. I, I want to figure it out. I mean, I, I've exactly. experienced with this kind of stuff yeah, you know, yeah. before, and I've seen... But the, see, the, the reason why I've enga- engaged you, Matt, in this interaction is because I can feel from you that you are not coming in with this idea. I, I think I know what it is right from the beginning, right. and I am going to prove that. Now, exactly. Channel 7, Channel 9, and all those people, that's what they did. They, right. they believed before it even began that they knew what was happening. And then what they did was they tried to prove that, you know. And, and then, on, unfortunately, they're willing to lie to try to prove that, mm-hmm. you know. And they're willing to then, and then they want to sensationalize the lie so that, you know, they turn it into hidden cameras, for example, when, you know, we've got actual footage of the cameras that are so called hidden, you know, mm-hmm. and things like that. And, so I feel you're not doing that, and that's why I'm glad, I'd I'm like glad. to engage that process with you. I feel that every person who's sincere engages a process of discovery. That's what I feel. So what I feel is a family that is concerned would engage a process of discovery by firstly listening to the person who, you know, who's a family member and also checking it out for themselves from the source of the information not through some kind of third party who has a tendency to lie for the sake of sensationalism. Now, a wise person would do that, I believe. And you're not going to help a family member get out of any cult while you attack the family member. Because the reality is, if you attack a family member, what you're doing is you're causing more like separation between yourself and that member. The way you have, if, if, if this is a cult, right, and I cannot agree that it is, we, and it's not even a religion. We don't have ministers, we don't have property, we don't have anything. Like, so it's not a religion and it's not a cult. We don't have rules, we don't have laws that we enforce, we don't excommunicate people if they don't live by the principles that we talk about. All Mary and I do, uh, the best way to uh, say it about our lives is they're basically presenters of seminars <laughs> and workshops because that's about as far as what we do. You know, that's pretty much all that we do. Um, and, and, and we let people make up their minds for themselves. Now, now, the average family member may not know that because of what's being presented to them through the media, right? which is very, very different to that. And so, of course, they make all the assumptions that I own a heap of property that I don't own, and that, you know, I've got some multi-million dollars worth of funds coming in when the bank account at the moment is $1,300, you know, and, and you, know, you know, there's all these assumptions that have, that have been made. And I understand them making, maybe, maybe making the assumptions through previous experience with this, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying that they shouldn't have that same assumption you know, with other people, because I, I, we were just in Brazil and we saw this guy, you know, on, the, on YouTube, you see this guy who says he's Jesus too, dressed in white, he's got, a, he's got a crown on his head and he's sitting on a throne saying Bible truths to anybody who comes along and he's got quite a lot of followers, mm-hmm. you know, and, and sure, I, you know, we, we, we've heard this other guy who says he's Jesus in, in Mexico, right, who, who has literally millions of followers, has huge amounts of money, has a six-man security team to keep him safe. And uh, yeah, I, you know, of course I'd look at all of that and, and, and I'd go, well, maybe this guy is the same. Maybe that's what you would assume. Yeah. However, if you are truly interested in the welfare of the family member who's investigating it, you would, you would do more than just trust what the media has to say about the situation and you'd actually find out for yourself what the guy's actually saying. Mm-hmm. Now, besides him, him saying he's Jesus, let's just put that aside for a moment, because I've got a lot, the average person's got a lot of judgments about a person who says he's Jesus, right? Let's look at all the other things he's saying, and let's see if they make sense or not. Let's see if they're logical or not. Let's see what he actually does. Does he actually demand people follow it? Does he, 
say to people everyone has to do this? What does he do? Well, that there's, you know, there's no chosen people. There's no, you're going to be saved if you do this and you're going to be, it, it's not an exclusive uh, group in any way. Mm-hmm. We encourage every person who ever hears us to live in the world and, in, and, and in, interact with everybody in the world but express love to each person in the world. That's the difficulty that most people have is they find a lot of difficulty in expressing love to each other. Do you then disapprove of people who, do you think that people who listen to what you're saying, Mm -hmm. but who then choose to essentially leave the wider world and come move up here into a very tightly knit community that doesn't interact as much as they would if they were living somewhere else, do you disapprove of that? behavior? Do you think that's the best way to practice what you're teaching? It's certainly not how I practice my teaching. Uh, so, I just, so I see there's issues. Yeah, I feel there's a lot of issues. Themselves in themselves in any way. Yeah. Mm. The, it, what myself and Mary do constantly, as you know, because it took some time for us to arrange our interview, is we spend time with people we don't know. <laughs> and, you know, discussing things, interacting with the world, traveling through the world. Uh, that's what we do with our life if we have the means to do it. We uh, have a lot of interest in world affairs and what happens in the world actually. Yeah. And in fact I keep encouraging everyone to let their you know, to let their love shine in the world. You know, you can't you can't hide your love by going into the bush somewhere and, you know, putting it like I would have said in the first century under a basket, you know, because because that's what you that's what a lot of people do want to do. And a lot of times that's driven by fear, you know, they're afraid of people and that's why they do it. So Mary and I chose to live here, well I chose to live here like I think I bought the property maybe six or seven years ago now with my own funds and that was before anybody was donating any funds to me and um, I lived here for a few years um, until Mary joined me, probably three three or, three or four years before, until Mary joined me and um, the, the you know, reality is nobody else who we knew lived here. That's the reason why I chose to live here actually, <laughs> because I wanted a place where myself and Mary could just go, have some privacy, because we spend a lot of time with people all the time. Sometimes that the rigors of that come quite demanding, as you probably know yourself, mm. and, and you need time out, you know, you need time by yourself and you need time to feel and to think and, you know. And so we came out here for that purpose. I, I purposely created this place so that we could have some privacy. We didn't, I didn't think at the time that sooner or later a lot of people who knew us would join us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the reality is that, uh, you know, we, it does make it more convenient in some ways for us because now instead of driving, we used to drive across to Brisbane and, and, the, Go- and the Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast every week um, and do seminars. Now I don't have to drive as far to do some of them. I can just do some of them here locally, you know. Um, so, I think, you know, I think also we need to be careful about making assumptions about people who've moved out here. Mm. Certainly we never um, tell people that they should do that. They've chosen to do that independent of us. Um, we have no knowledge of their choices or, or no. what properties they've bought. or A lot of times we don't even still know where they live. Like, uh, and also we don't, we don't have a lot to do with how they live their day-to-day life. So yeah. our teachings do not encourage people to isolate themselves. It, humility is about being intera- in interaction with everyone and every situation in the world openly and lovingly. Um, so we don't control what they do and I don't know if we we can say that they're isolated from interactions. I mean, I know many I of them still believe. work in this community and yeah, most um, of them work have in the contact community. with their families. Many of them have contact with their families. A lot of... Um, the only times they don't is when their families attack them and they don't like to be attacked, obviously, like the average person, and so they withdraw from them. But, but the, the reality is that uh, the majority of uh, the people we do know have moved out here because they started to connect to some desires that they had that they couldn't fulfill in a city. So some of them had a desire to have a property of their own to, to nurture and care for, like to, to actually bring an ecosystem into harmony with love is, is, is some of their desires. And so some of them came out here because of that one purpose. They, you know, they, they wanted to find some land that was relatively cheap at the time and now it's become more expensive unfortunately but initially it was relatively cheap and that they could work with and 
But given uh, all of the vastness of the Australian continent, the fact that they've chosen to live within like fifty kilometers, yeah, yeah. fifty kilometers of us, yeah, I, like obviously they have an issue with that. <laughs> but yeah. I don't like. And but also, and I agree. Like we were very shocked that that happened. <laughs> really, Mary, Mary was not only shocked. But if you put it more plain. <laughs> well, initially I was quite worried about it because I felt this was our haven. Um, for time for us and I was concerned that uh, we would have people, people would on our front doorstep uh, every five minutes wanting a clarification on something that was said in the seminar. Um, <laughs> that hasn't actually eventuated. People no, everyone's been really of respectful space. of our space and time and it's rare for us to have yeah. visitors uh, without them being unannounced. <laughs> but there are quite a number of people that we know who live in other areas of Australia mm -hmm. yeah. as well. So. Um, it's just these particular people have decided to come here. And a lot of people do when they have similar uh, um, philosophies in life, do gather with other people with similar philosophies, mostly because it makes it easier to practice those philosophies in some ways. Now, I don't agree. I don't, know if I agree. I don't agree with that idea, but, um, but that's what some of them might prob might probably. To, to be honest with you, I don't really know, Matt, why many of them chose to come here. Uh, well, why? Um, well, yes, and we have three of them right here. <laughs> yeah, like... Igor you lost me yesterday. Well, well, I understand why Igor did, because yeah, he was quite plain with me about why. Like, Igor said, I want to, you know, the way you're doing your videos is a mess, and the way you're doing <laughs> your sound is a mess, which it was, you know. And Igor said to me, I'd like to... You know, sort that out for you, you know, because, because I, I feel from Igor a very strong desire to have this truth just delivered to the world as freely as possible. And so Igor told me quite straight why he wanted to be here. For Joy, I don't think we've ever discussed why you came. Um, I've always had, well, from, from, from first learning the teachings, I had a strong desire to support in any way I can. So I just remember you telling us in September 09 in my dining room, actually, most important thing we can do on the planet today is share divine truth. Yeah. And that's... Well, couldn't you share it more widely if you stayed back in... You used to live in, uh, in the Gold Coast, on the Gold Coast? Yeah. Couldn't you have shared it more widely there? Because it's a much higher, larger population. And... Um, Here it's sort of preaching the converted to a certain extent, isn't it? That's true. Well, there's only but sharing doesn't mean I can teach. I'm not in a high enough condition of love to actually go out and teach. So right now I feel that my role See, is... See, I disagree support. with that. I, okay. That's how Joy feels about yeah. himself, but I don't agree with that. I feel that anybody who learns truth can teach it. They just got to be humble the way they teach it. So my, so even Joy, who people believe is my follower, <laughs> I, and I don't agree on the issue of whether Joy could share mm -hmm. the truth or not. And the the reality is, I feel that one of the things that was great with Joy, Joy's had experience in organising events. And we have no, no real experience. I've had some. Mary's had no ex real experience in organising events of any kind up, uh, above about 30 people. <laughs> and, and the reality is, you know, the way we're operating all the time, we do need that kind of assistance. And Joy, one of the feelings, things that Joy said to us was, I would like to help you organise some of these events, because again, like, we were trying to organise them and it wasn't always, <laughs> it was always a bit messy as well. Which it was is, very time consuming. And time consuming. It's the time consuming. Yeah. And so the more I can do to support that. Yeah. And so I see that as a desire yeah. that you've had to be here. But uh, you love the bush, don't you? I love the bush and I've always loved the bush and yeah. always wanted to be more self-responsible like we were talking about yesterday. Mm. Um, but so three out of three people who moved up here in this room after you guys did said that they moved here to support you, to support what you're doing. Well, they're not really supporting me. Yes, to, to support what you're doing. Message. Yes, yes. Because, because the, message. the reality is the guys haven't really worked out whether I'm Jesus or not. They just love the, they love what's being taught. So, so what I feel from them more is a strong feeling about what's being taught. They, they have a strong feeling about about love in particular, like the need for there to be more love on the planet, how to achieve more love on the planet, the need for more truth, the need to work through emotional error, you know, emotional um, uh, injuries inside of a person that cause them to be unloving, to, to let go of those things. These guys believe in that like really wholeheartedly. I can feel that. But, but 
I, I don't agree that they all, you know, they often disagree with me. Um, so they don't just accept what I'm saying mm. as, a, as, as if it's true all the time. <laughs> but I think what I was trying to get at was they did move up here because of you. I mean, there are other communities even... Uh, yeah, but when you're looking at Igor and, and, and Lena and Joy, they, their situ- personal situation is very different to other people that have moved here. Like, most of the other people who have moved here, we do not have day-to-day or daily or, or weekly contact with, except if we see them at a seminar or some or kind of book group or in the supermarket or something. And most of them, we don't have any idea what they're doing with their day-to-day but life. I wouldn't agree. They chose to move here because we live here. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I guess but I don't what AJ is saying is <laughs> that had very little do, to do with us saying it's had nothing to do with us. Yeah, here, no, you know. I, I we that. don't make their yeah. decisions for them and we didn't recommend their decision either. Um, so, so you know, I, I can't take responsibility for the actions of things that I have not recommended nor, <laughs> nor, sure. nor promoted. Um, I understand why some of them have moved here from a, you know, from a purely being involved type of level or helping level or or so from a level of, um, um, you know, wanting to connect more with their, you know, day-to-day passions. Um, yeah, because so, I'm sure the guys yesterday talked to you about God's Way of Love, the organisation, mm-hmm. and th- that people felt quite inspired about that initially, yeah. that they wanted to... Um, be a part of what does it mean to really live these teachings in an active way mm-hmm. in the, in the community? But I think a but, lot have moved here because they wanted help to do that. That's on what a I was just about to basis, say. Rather than a desire to give. That they felt inspired about it, and then they got here and realised, oh, it's not actually about being helped to do that. It's about taking responsibility for that. And yeah. now they're actually less inspired, Matt. Yeah. Like a lot of them feel like, hmm. I'm, because their desire wasn't one to serve, and that is very much our desire. And so. yeah, so we do see that some of the people that have moved here probably would have regretted their decision, I would have thought. Mm. Um, and some of them probably mm. would have, oh, I think some of them maybe have moved back to the coast or wherever else they These prefer guys to live. probably know better than us about um, yeah, yeah, we don't know really much of what goes on because, as I said, we don't have any control over what people do or say. Or and many moved just to be close to the seminar, just to be have the access, you know, they have to drive thousands of kilometers yeah. because they want to hear the truth. They were happy with us driving thousands of kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> because many seminars take place in these areas, so they want to be close to them. Yeah, well, that's the case now, but originally we did all of our seminars over on the coast and Brisbane and, mm-hmm. you know, the, the cities and so forth. Do you feel... Sorry, again. Uh, do you feel a sense of responsibility for the people who are trying to you know, live their lives according to what you're talking about? No, the only person I'm responsible for is myself. And um, whether people make a choice to listen to what I say and attempt to practice it, I don't believe many of them are practicing it, but, but I, even that I don't say to them like, unless they ask. Um, the, I don't feel any sense of responsibility unless I have a feeling that I've, I've actually said something that's inaccurate or incorrect and then, of course, I have a feeling of responsibility about that. But so. sometimes, when you see um, when you see a friend doing something, somebody that you care about doing something that you think is damaging to them or is not the best thing that they can do, don't you feel like we have a responsibility just as a human being to say to point out? No, not if they don't want me to. Like if it's sort of like if you said to me, AJ. Hey, can you tell me a bit about what you believe about my life and what you observe in my life that I might not be able to see? Now there's an invitation for me to say something to you. And if you weren't interacting with me on a daily basis, there would be no real reason for me to to say any of that unless you have a desire to hear it. I would sense? think the people who moved up here would probably already have invited. They would be open to hearing that from you. And will I take that opportunity? If I, if I, there's someone I know through the teachings who is I can see is obviously um, neglecting love of themselves or love of others. I take that opportunity to point that out. If they only, do, only if only I if don't we're call having, them up and or find out where they yeah, live. Only if, if we're having a personal interaction with them. Yeah, sure, I don't mean you know, know calling everyone what you need to say. Oh, I yeah, heard you were. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, then it would be brushing your teeth. Then it would be a cop, wouldn't it? Sure. If I bump into them in Woolworths, then I can hear that they're 
you know, or they think that they're living these teachings and they're actually doing something in opposition with it, I, I definitely spend the time and talk to them about what I can say. Hey, like, that's not actually what we're talking about. Yeah, and but even for me, it's even more refined than that. Like, I, I don't have any need to tell anybody anything about their personal life, whether I disagree with what's happening in their life or not, until such a time as they interact with me personally, mm-hmm. or secondly, I see somebody else being damaged through the process then I feel that I have to say something. So it's a bit like if I saw you smacking your daughter or, or whatever, um, you know, I would, I would probably want to come up and say something about the violence, you know, towards, towards the child. Um, and a lot of people would say, it's none of your business, it's my child. i say, I'm sorry, but actually, no, this is about an issue of love and your child's being harmed, you know, so it is, it, it is now everybody's business around you, really, uh, to actually say something to you about it. If they want to be violent with their child and with me, then 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 I'm not going to retaliate with that. I'm not mm, going to sure. you know, harm them in return. But I sort of feel like you really need to say the question you're really asking, isn't it? Like the question, because, no, because you're not getting well, the answer you want. Yeah. Um, because I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm, really, I'm exploring a, a kind of channel of thought here. What I, what so what's the channel of thought? You? Let's yeah. be open about it. Yeah. I, I sensed. Yesterday in our meeting, people were very lovely and, you know, open and very sweet people. But I sensed a deep undercurrent of sadness uh, among many of them. You know, whether that's related to childhood trauma, whether that's related to just a general sense of dissatisfaction in their previous personal relationships. I sensed. A, a really deep well of sadness. And can, I, can I be if... frank with you about that though, Matt? The reality is that the majority of people on the planet have a deep well of sadness about broken past relationships, harm that's been done to them as a child, mm-hmm. things they've done to other people during their life. The only difference between these people you've met and those other people is the other people deny it. These I wouldn't people agree that not. that's the only difference. Yeah. I would say the, the main difference is that these people have packed up their lives and put basically the rest of their lives on hold to move out here. Many of them have families who are quite upset with them and it's causing trauma in their interpersonal relationships with their parents. Yeah, but can you see that if a family is upset with you, you're not going to be close to them? It's only if the same family continues to accept your choice and decision that you're going to be close to them. No, I mean, I'm look, I, I have a Jewish mother who is... Um, quite often vocal with me about you know some of the decisions I've made in my life. Mm-hmm. She's always uh, proud of me, always... Uh, yeah, but see, for, the, for many of these people, their families aren't proud, proud of them. But when I've their made decisions are, that my feel mother... very, very different about them. But when I've made decisions that my mother has felt were not healthy, mm-hmm. um, you know, she's not hesitated to tell me that. Yeah, and that's fine. But then has she tried to manipulate your life in order to change it? Yeah, but we're still close, you know. It's a, it's a Jewish family. That's kind of what we do. <laughs> you would know. You were born into a Jewish family in the first century. <laughs> yeah, you know but, like. but I always refuse the manipulation mm. in the first century, as I do now. I don't agree with families manipulating family members in any way. I feel love should be the underlying indicator of all relationships. Now, if somebody wants to go into the bush and have a cry for a while, and they were my son, I would support them. Mm. Uh, I would say to them, you know, obviously, that if, the, if that continued for a long period of time, for years and years and years, without me observing them becoming more happy as a result, then I'd say that to them. And I'd say to them, look, are you really doing what's good for you? Yeah, but I would wait for the observation before I made the judgment call. Not tell them right up front that they're doing the wrong thing just because I'm afraid. Sure. And what I see happening in most families on the planet is that they are afraid rather than trusting that their own children can make decisions and then and then reverse them later i i believe that if you have brought up your child in the way that you can you, that you actually believe in them you will believe that they'll have the ability to sort out their own life sooner or later during their life the reality is also that any so-called cult on the planet and um, can be you know can be left if you decide to leave it. And uh, and I certainly can't agree that this is a cult because I don't have any control over what people do. I don't tell people what to do. There's no compound, there's no, like I said, there's none of these other things. 
if the people decide to come out and live here, if I was a family member watching that and I was concerned, I would express my concern, but I wouldn't get angry and frustrated with them and, and negative with them about it. You wouldn't? If you, if you thought that your two sons joined, you know, had joined a, a cult? Well, let's say they joined the cult of the army. No, let's say they joined a the cult like... Or they joined the know, cult of the Catholic Church. <laughs> Shall we call it that? Yeah, even that, I mean... Because I, it's I'm a cult. Um, that is a cult. Yeah, I mean... The reality is they I, have I a structure, these, a power structure and everything else. I said to these guys yesterday, part of the reason I think I can maybe be a little more open with this is that as an atheist, <laughs> there's nothing in one religion that I find to be particularly more convincing than another. Oh, of course. I think it's course. kind of hypocritical for somebody to say, well, here's this guy who says he's Jesus, and that's ridiculous because we all know our Jesus is the right <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jesus. Exactly. So, you know, I have no reason to suspect that you are any less of Jesus than anybody else. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so if my so, sons, yeah. so if my son decided yeah, yeah. to join the Catholic Church, what would I do? Which you consider to be a cult? Which, well, it's immaterial what I consider it to be, to be frank. But yeah, yes, it is a cult in the sense that it has a power structure. It has a certain belief system that is enforced. If you do not believe it, you get excommunicated. So yes, it has a very, very different structure. Mm-hmm. Um, none of those things we have. So, so, so yes, I sort of see a lot of organised religion today as as a cult that it forces people into a certain line of thinking and if they don't agree with that then they get excommunicated they get you know removed from it and the reality is that almost everyone around us has a completely different viewpoint of life and world that I currently have but I don't excommunicate them from my life the only time that I don't associate with people is because they treat if they treat me badly <laughs> and that is an act of uh, self-worth rather than anything else but let's go back to the son. child. child. Uh, so if my son joined, wanted to join a Catholic suit, I'd say go ahead. Find out, but be open. Be open, find out about everything. Investigate. I trust you enough, right? And I trust that I've taught you enough to be able to be open and investigate and understand what is going on. And, and I believe that sometime in the future you'll probably see that the decision was born from some reason that you had to do that, but I don't know, and, and, and you won't know until you do it. Mm. So, so I would encourage him to do it, in the sense, encourage him if that's what he chooses or desires to do, then go ahead and do it. I, if I, if, if that, that church then encouraged him to go to war like it did in the Second World War, it encouraged most Germans and most other people of other nationalities to go to war, I'd say something about that. I'd say, son, look, I don't agree with war. And you know, I thought I brought you up to not agree with war either, and uh, and so you know, I can't agree now with the action you're taking, but but it is your life. You know, you have to choose to do what you what you have to choose to do. But make sure you're informed. Make sure you're going to war. If you're going to go to war, make sure it's for the reasons you believe in, rather than you wouldn't try to stop your son from going to war if he was fighting in the Nazi army. No. This is why, see, everyone's confused about me because they believe that I am controlling and yet I wouldn't control my own son from doing something that I personally could not agree with. Do you think that that's controlling or it's just concern? I mean... It's not about... So concern is my, my expressing the truth that if he goes to war and kills people then it's very, very damaging to his soul. That's the truth. If, and to other people. And, and to other people. Obviously it harms other people's lives and, that, and, that, and it's very damaging. That's saying the truth. When, when I now try to manipulate his decision, now I'm out of line because I have no right to manipulate the decision of another. Let me ask you another hypothetical then along those lines. <laughs> You're standing on a subway platform mm-hmm. and your son is on the subway platform with you and your son says to you, in one minute, the six train is going to come up that platform mm-hmm. with enough power to blow in, you know, apart if I step in front of it. I'm going to step in front of that train and I'm going to kill myself. Yeah. Would you just try to talk? Would you try to talk him out of it? Yeah, I've got a minute to try and talk him out of it. But you wouldn't grab him and pull him back from no. walking in front of the train. You'd let your son commit suicide in front of you. Yes. Why? That sounds like dogma to me. That's how like, how different is that to me letting him go to war? I think it's a clearer decision. I don't think so. Well, because you just, don't know, he, he, you may not lose him. In the f- in the example you gave, the hypothetical, by the way, you know, the chances of this ever happening with my son are very remote. Right? Yeah, However, I should hope so. I really hope. <laughs> because so. I've brought him up well enough to understand sure. that life is sacred, right? However, if he if he doesn't understand that his own life is sacred, then I would be sincerely looking at why, I, like, there's something that I've not done that's obviously not 
okay, good, to cause him to believe his life isn't sacred. And I'd also be trying to convince him that his life, I've got a minute to try to convince him that his life is sacred and it's very, very important that he doesn't destroy it. And I, he will also know from previous discussions with me that, that I believe life is eternal anyway. So even if he died, um, he's still going to have to deal with the same emotional reason why he wants to commit suicide that he had just before he committed suicide. So what I would be saying to him is that we can work through whatever the issues are emotionally that cause him to desire to commit suicide without him committing suicide. And in fact, it would be easier for us to do so while we're together here than if he's died and somewhere else. And, and so these are the things I'd say to him in that minute, but it's highly unlikely I wouldn't have already said them to him for, the, for all the discussions I've already had with him, right? Now, now his choice to, to take his own life is, is the same decision as the choice to take another person's life, in that life, all life is sacred, all life. Your life is just as sacred as mine. If I chose to kill myself, that would be me not valuing my own life. That is a, a lack of, a, this is a, a belief inside of me that life is not sacred. If I chose to kill you, then I believe your life isn't sacred. Mm -hmm. Either choice, from what I believe is God's perspective, is unethical, whether I choose to take my own or choose to take yours. So for me, my son going to war is just the same as him killing himself. But what I guess I don't see is where the difference is between working to convince somebody over a period of time, uh, working to convince somebody of something over a period of time, uh, I wouldn't be working to convince him. But, but you said you, you would have taught him to value life, you would have taught him that that's not to convincing. Life. That's not convincing him. There's it's a up difference to him. between, if I'm going, Matt, don't do it. If you, you know, and this is where manipulation comes in, you know, when people try to con... Sorry. Sorry, it's all right. It's your question. No, but go ahead. I'm passionate about it. So, anyway, yeah, that's yeah. Okay. It's nice to see people who are passionate about um, it. <laughs> Passion comes across on the page. <laughs> <laughs> if the writer is good. I'm all right. <laughs> uh, um, it's all right. I lost my train of thought. One is about giving truth and the other is about trying to make an, an trying argument. Trying to change the person's mind. And this is where I see a lot of families operate. They operate in the realm of manipulation and convincing and, and investment in what they want rather than a giving of truth. To each and other. just letting the other person make and a choice. And the allowance of choices. And this is the cult of families, man. Yeah. The cult of a family, unfortunately, has created huge amounts of drama on this planet in the sense that parents force, often force their children through actions which are very, very similar to the actions taken by governments and religions. They try to force their child into taking a certain action that the family believes is right. Now, that, that is a cult forcing another person to take actions that the family or somebody else believes is right is a cult. There's no doubt about that. If you look at the definitions of what a cult does, it's exactly what they do. The reason why there are so many cults on this planet is because most children are brought up in one, right? And, and so therefore can easily accept one, a cult, as an adult being in one. The, a person who is truly free is able to state the truth to another person without attempting to force that person into changing their mind. That's what a person who loves would do. So a person who truly loves you, a parent who truly loves you, would tell you, I cannot agree with the action that you're taking. These are the logical reasons why I cannot agree with such an action. However, it is not my right to make a decision for your life. That's up to you. Only you have the ability to make a decision for your life. Even if I agree, disagree with your decision, you have the right to make the decision. Even if that decision is to kill me, you've got the right to make that decision with your life. I don't think it's a very good one, but it's your right if you want to take it. And, and this is my belief that I firmly you know, state to, to every single person. I do not believe that you have the right to tell another person what to do. You've only got the right to advise or to tell them the truth or what you believe is the truth. Because remember, a lot of the times what you believe is the truth may not necessarily be. 
So you've only got the right to inform them as to what you believe the truth to be, and then you need to allow them to make their own choice and decision. Can I pose that I think that if you were in that position, if you were really in that hypothetical position, I think that you would grab your son out from in front of that train. I no, think any father would. I know you believe that, but again, that is your belief. And my beliefs about death are not the same as yours. Because you're an atheist, you believe that if you die, you're dead, right? I assume. I'm not sure, but you know. <laughs> you're not sure that there yeah. is any afterlife, sure. is that no, correct? No, definitely not. I am firmly convinced there one because I've lived in it. So, so to me, my son hasn't died and I can still interact with him even if he does pass. So I'm not afraid of his death. All I am trying to do is telling the truth about it. And that is that if he chooses to die, he is not honoring his life. He is not, you know, honoring why also he's avoiding his life. He's trying to avoid something that's happening in his life, emotionally avoid it. And I believe that even if he passes into the spirit world that I believe exists, that he will continue trying to emotionally avoid exactly the same issue that he tried to avoid seconds earlier when he committed suicide. So my belief system is completely different to yours. And many people in the first century, Matt, did not understand me because they didn't understand my belief system was completely different. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so therefore they didn't understand my actions. And, and most people today are in exactly the same boat. Almost every person from the media that I've spoken to does not believe what I'm saying to them about these personal matters because they don't have the same perspective I have. And I understand that, I get that. But it doesn't mean that my perspective isn't this, that I'm stating to you. What kind of person does believe what you're saying? Well, I don't know if anybody at the present really does believe everything that I'm saying. And I think the only kind of person who believes some of it is a person who's actually put it into practice in their own lives and discovered that what I'm saying about that particular thing is true. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in other words, they've experimented with it. So what we encourage people to do is to experiment with the truth. So to, and that means not just what I say, but experiment with what everybody says to them to find out whether it's true or not. And we encourage the experimentation to discover truth. And so, so in this process, many of the people who have heard what we've been telling them have gone, okay, I, you know, I don't really believe he's Jesus, and uh, you know, I put that aside for a bit, many of them do. I don't understand why they do, because I wouldn't personally do that if it was me, but because uh, I'd want to resolve that issue as well. You know, I'd be asking a lot of questions about that issue, but a lot of people don't, they put that aside. And then they listen to the rest of it and they go, oh, this emotional thing. Yes, I can feel that I have anger in me. So, so what I'll do is I'll try to, you know, address some of these emotions, you know, and see how I go with it. And once they put that into practice and they realise that there's a lot of fear and addiction that created their anger, they go, yes, so what are you saying about that is true, that there is addiction driving my anger. Every time I get angry, it's because somebody didn't give me what I wanted, you know. And, and so they see the relationship between that. And so that particular thing they accept as truth. And then you get people who also experiment with the stuff we're saying about God. So in other words, we've encouraged people to have an emotional longing for God's love to enter them and to just see what happens, to experiment with that. To, but it has to be sincere, of course. And, and so they have to have a sincere longing if they wish to, ex if they wish to receive that, that love from God. And they go away and do that in their own life. And then sometimes they have these experiences where they feel this love into them. And so then they believe that to be true. But I mean the kind of person who comes, I mean, one very common uh, um, reaction to seeing your DVDs for the first time, for example, where they were introduced was people say, I was enraptured kind of by it. I, I saw it and I just, and I spent three days or whatever it is just watching them. So that's before they put them into practice, right? That's just something caught them about it. I wonder what you think. What kind of a person, what are they you know, searching for? What kind of place are they at in their life to be you know, open to that kind of experience? And I feel the answer to that's very simple. There's two things going on. One, the first thing is that um, people, when they hear things that resonate with their own belief systems already in their soul, they already have an affinity towards it. They already have this feeling of, yes, I've always thought that, or yes, I've always felt that. 
like you know when I speak for example when I speak about love on the planet and how you know there's a lot of words of love but very little action of love a lot of people feel a lot of connection with that because that is true you know the reality is there is a lot of words of love but but far less actions of love on the planet and and when you speak the truth to a person that they already have some kind of feeling for in themselves they go oh wow yeah that's exactly what I feel and so that then causes them to want to listen to more and see whether it's true or not and um, I've had many people listen for a year of course and felt that everything they heard was true and then there's one thing that I've said that they don't believe is true and then after that they won't listen to anymore so that's happened very many times there's literally thousands of people that have done that so so the reason why that one thing doesn't res resonate with them is that obviously they don't have an opening towards that particular thing that I'm saying and so that doesn't resonate with them and then many people decide to wipe off all the previous thing as a result of that one thing unfortunately and I feel that's a pretty unfortunate thing it's a bit like as the saying goes throwing out the baby with the bathwater but but that's their choice and they're allowed to make it uh, they have free will so I feel that's the first thing that happens. So people who already have an affinity. Yes second thing that happens is that there are spirits in the spirit world who do know of our identity they know who I am they know who Mary is they have and many of these spirits are connected with every single person who ever hears the truth of two and this is always the case you right now have a group of spirits right with you right now that are determining what happens a lot of times or making suggestions to you that you accept because of the emotions that you have and and every single person on the planet is exactly the same including myself so so when we we are basically associating with people here on earth as well as people who have passed uh, in our day-to-day -day life now some of the people who have passed have heard these truths before or heard of the things that myself and Mary have taught before and they believe them to be true and so those spirits influence the people on earth to to listen there are other spirits in on the spirit world who disagree completely with what we say and those spirits influence people to not even hear a word of it like and to just have hatred and revenge feelings towards us and and, and that's what happens too there is all and I know you don't believe in all this but there is a there is this unseen forces also operating upon the earth which is one of the reasons why the earth has struggled to change fast you know it, you think there's a lot of intelligent people on the planet who can see that war you know in the end is not you know advisable they can see that when people were in peace they grow usually more they, they understand more when they're in a peaceful environment, they're more educated if they're in a peaceful environment. Uh, we can see all of these underlying truths generally, but um, if, if we all see them so much, how come the earth isn't changing? Well, it's because there is also these unseen influences upon the earth as well, which I talked about in the first century um, as well as now, and which most people who are atheists or, or, or non, you know, don't believe in an afterlife, can't agree with and that's fine that's their opinion and they're allowed to have that as well and um, I'm just saying that these are things that I see and observe and uh, and so I'll talk about them so I believe the people who you are questioning about the people who have this instant response they are not instantly acting and the reason why they're not instantly acting is because it is yet to settle in their own heart but there is an instant response because their own, they have their own feelings about the material that is being presented. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, they have these spirits influencing them in some direction, positively or negatively. So then what does it say about somebody like me, that the first time I saw it, or somebody like Andrew, we were watching him last night, didn't have any... It was just like, yeah, you know, it's a, it, it, I've heard some of this before and it seems like a nice guy, eloquent, but... <laughs> I, I really take it or leave it. Well, I don't even believe I'm that eloquent. Um, <laughs> my diction is poor and so forth, but that comes with being an Aussie, right? But the, um, I, I feel, again, it's all driven by a lot of our life experiences and many of the other things that have occurred in our life. The reality is that many of us cannot feel love when it's present. We can't because we've been detuned from it. We believe cer certain things to be loving that are not. For example, if you look at the average person in a religion, the average person in a religion believes that love will sometimes be violent. They believe that God is sometimes violent. Mm -hmm. They believe that God is sometimes punishing. God is sometimes vengeful. God is sometimes wrathful. So they actually believe, if God is love, they actually believe that love is sometimes violent. Love is sometimes punishing. 
love is sometimes wrathful. I can't agree, but that's what they believe, right? Now, if you believe that, you will accept a belief that actually surrounds that belief. But I don't believe that. I, I, I don't think that if there were a God that he would be wrathful. That's one of the things that I find preposterous about. Did your father um, physically punish you when you were a child? Yeah, sure. And do you feel he loves you? I don't know, I have a tough relationship with my father. But I have a great relationship with my mother and I have a great relationship with my wife. I feel love. But the question know, was, do you feel your father loves you? I think my father loved me in his limited way. I think he was a limited guy. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I, I can't, I feel that he can't have loved you. Because of, he, of his actions. Because of his actions. His actions were violent. A person who loves doesn't have violent actions. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm not sure that I can agree with that necessarily. That's what I'm saying. You yes. don't agree with that. So you actually believe love is violent sometimes. I don't think that it's love that's violent, but I think that somebody who loves someone can act violently towards them. That's not a loving thing to do. No, I but agree with that completely. validate the fact that they love you. So what if you loved somebody for your entire life and then just before the last time you saw them, they acted in a very violent way for you. Would that invalidate and mean that they didn't love you for all that period of time? No, but it means that they didn't love you in that moment. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I can accept that, but it doesn't mean that you associate love with violence. You would associate love with all the great parts. No, but they obviously associate love with violence. Right, but I'm saying, why, why for me? You know, because I had a father who, you know, acted violently. But can you see that if, if you have a father that acted violently, he obviously associated love with violence. He believes that he can love you still and be violent towards you. Mm, but what does that have to do with me? Well, you've accepted that as a belief. Not really. I mean, I, I'm not violent towards my wife. I'm not violent towards anybody else that I love. I but would you go to war um, to defend your country or defend your wife? No, probably not. No, I, I'm not. I'm, I don't really. I, like, I've, I've gone to war as a journalist. Um, I've seen yeah. war. Yeah. And uh, it's a terrible and, and awful thing. Yeah, um, sure. So I, you know, I didn't sign up for the army after 9/11 yeah. happened. I, you know, wouldn't uh, do but that. Can, can you see though that if you say to yourself that my father loved me? even when he was being violent towards me, that there would, if you had that viewpoint, that your viewpoint of love would be distorted. No, I, I, can't, I can't accept that. And I also don't think that, you know, I think that that's a very black and white way eh, of looking at things. Everything I do is black and white. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Like, now, whether somebody accepts it or not, it's okay. Like, I don't, it doesn't worry me if you accept it or not. I'm so, but I am saying to you that, if everyone on the planet accepts that love is sometimes violent, then of course what we have on the planet will be sometimes violent. Yeah, for sure, I accept but that. But if everybody on the planet accepted that love is never violent, and we all wanted to be loving, then we'd all not accept the violence. Mm -hmm. Can that's you see? A, you know, it, right. it, that's a, a hypothetical that probably won't be particularly helpful to the world because... Yeah, but it's no different than the hypothetical who... you asked me about my son. <laughs> yeah, but neither one of those is going to, I didn't think my hypothetical was going to save the world either, you know, and, and you're talking about the way that you'd like to see change in the world. No, I believe it will. See, the difference is that I have a strong belief in the underlying principles of a human's ability to change. I don't, I feel that, you know, every person in the media I've met, obviously through your experience, has a fairly large degree of feelings that things are not going to probably change very significantly or very much because many of you can see, and understandably so, the hearts of people are not inclined to change. I believe, though, that like there are many people we've met that once they've started uh, listening about the principles of love, they've developed a heart that desires to change. And, and I feel that's the key to change on the planet. The, the real key to change on the planet is that people begin to develop they get over their hopelessness, I suppose, is the, feel, is the feeling that is the main feeling that people have. People have this underlying feeling of hopelessness towards the planet, towards change, towards you know it becoming any better in a very rapid way. You know, they, they feel that change is very slow, almost an inexorable process that they cannot, uh, that they can't define or be a part of. I don't agree with that. I feel that change can be very rapid, but it involves the, the ability to change your own heart. Does that make sense? Like, unless each of us individually is committed to changing our own heart, then the world itself cannot change because the world is a reflection of what's in our hearts. 
So if, if, if in my heart I justify violence under certain circumstances, then of course those, when those circumstances appear, I will become violent because I've justified violence under those circumstances inside of my heart. Whatever is in my heart, and I said this very regularly in the first century, whatever is in my heart is what I will finish up doing. And the reason why we have a world that we currently have is that, is that people do not necessarily see that it's what's in their heart that creates the world. Now, one by one, which is the only way it can actually happen, we have the ability to change our heart. We have the ability to actually change our tendencies towards violence. Um, and we have our ability to actually take out from ourselves through an emotional process the, the reason why we have a tendency towards violence. If we do that, then we've got the ability to affect the world. Because from that moment on, we are not contributing to the violence that's on the planet. Do you think the world... I'm sorry, chunk. Um, do you think that the world is uh, going in a negative direction in that, con in, in, in that context? Do you think that the world is... That there's mm -hmm. more violence and that, there's, that we're trending towards negative things? Or that we're trending towards positive things? No, I feel quite strongly that we're trending towards positive things. And I feel the reason why that is occurring is because there is more education, but there's also a higher uh, emphasis, uh, and, and this is not a religious statement, but more of a statement about what happens in the world. There is a higher emphasis in the general population towards just forgiving people. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, you know, they see a person takes an action that is negative or unloving, and then there's a tendency in the person to work through their emotions a bit and forgive the person who's, uh, who's taken the action rather than always try to punish the person for their action. So the beauty of that is that it causes change. It's slow because we still, many of us, are unable to look at the underlying emotion in the side of our heart that caused us to act in the manner that we acted. And I believe if we all examine the causes it would change much more rapidly. But I do feel that the Earth is changing in a positive direction. And in fact, uh, I feel that if it was changing in a negative direction, um, my actions would still be the same. But, but, but at the, at the end result, I feel, is that the Earth itself, and the, well, more importantly, the people on it, have slowly been working into more and more strong conditions of truth. And in doing that, we've had to confront religious history, we've had to confront political history, we've even had to confront the whole idea of family clans, you know, fighting for their own rights and so forth. And all of these things are being slowly confronted on the planet. We have the ability to confront them more rapidly and change them more rapidly if we chose to. Unfortunately, though, on the planet, things don't change uh, unless people desire to change. And, and the voice of reason, and a lot of times that is scientific reason, you know, prevails and people start realising, well, yeah, obviously if we're going to fight each other, that's going to cause a lot of negative things on the planet and that causes a lot of destruction and, and obviously that's not too conducive to everyone being happy. And we can see all of these kind of relationships, um, but very few of us look at our own contribution to it mm -hmm. in terms of how we personally contribute. And I feel if we looked more carefully at how we personally contribute and we all decided to make a different shift, then, then things would change much more rapidly. Like, you know, for example, um, you know, the eating meat issue. Um, you know, I recommend everybody to, to watch the movie Earthlings, which is a movie that's narrated by... Um, it's a documentary that's narrated by the actor who did Walk the Line. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix? Yes, Joe and Phoenix. And um, it's just a, a, a very frank, truthful presentation of what happens with meat production on the planet. Now, the average person who looks at that can't come away from it going, oh, I don't think it's bad, you know? The average person goes, wow, yeah, I don't, you know, this meat thing starting to bother me a bit after that. And this is the beauty of truth, is that when the more truth you give to people, the, uh, the initial reaction sometimes is ridicule, which is how most people act towards me now. You know, most people ridicule me pretty much most of the time. And then, uh, you know, then often they turn to violence after that, you know, because the ridicule doesn't work. The ridicule doesn't stop a person who's truly passionate about something. So they turn to violence. And if you survive the violence, 
then uh, generally it gets to acceptance, where people start to accept certain things as true. And uh, they actually state that in that movie, the, the movie, Earthlings documentary. Now, when you, when you watch that, you sort of go, hmm, there's my creation. My creation is my desire for meat, my desire to eat it, creates events such as this. And, and if I start to look at the relationship between my desire and what I'm, and what I'm creating, then there's a chance that I'll change. I'm not saying it will, because it's in the end, it is the right of every person to make their own choice. But there is a higher chance, once you know the truth, that you will change. But see, this is something we were talking about yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you use technology, for example. Mm -hmm. you're, you're a vegetarian because you don't want to have your actions, your desire or demand for meat causing harm to the earth and to animals. To animals, yeah. 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 And to people. And to people. Because I believe any, any person killing animals has got to numb themselves emotionally to the process of killing animals. So going beyond that, technology, these cameras, for example, have, mm -hmm. you know, uh, copper that was mined in... Gold, like, copper, silver, like I'm in electronics coal industry. Yeah, same. exactly. That was mined, you know, most likely in horrible conditions in, you know, the Eastern Demo Democratic Republic of Congo, where five million people, more people have died there from the conflict related to those minerals in the last decade than in any other conflict since World War II. Mm -hmm. And it continues to be a horrific humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. yep. and, and is caused directly by our desire for faster, newer, bigger tellies, more cameras. Yep. Why, why, why do you draw the line at vegetarianism and, and you don't you know, eschew these kind of uh, material goods that cause just the same kind of damage? Yeah, I don't worse? draw the line of all of those things. I feel that as I become more loving, I will give up all of those kind of things. It's just a development in love that has to occur. So, so I believe in the end that in the end we will either mine all of these things in a more appropriate manner, like because there's no harm in the technology itself in the sense that, like, and there's no harming in mining minerals if it's done in a loving manner. We can, we are capable of doing it in a loving manner. That's the reality. The difference is you're not capable of killing an animal in a loving manner. I don't believe. So, so I feel there's a big difference between the two. However, if we are now incapable of mining something in a loving manner, then I agree certainly that it would be unethical to continue using that particular thing until such a time as we were capable of mining it in a loving manner. But so then why don't you give up things like that technology? Because we aren't in a, in a place where we can mine those things ethically. They, they are mined and they do cause havoc and death and yeah, but the reality is I also know that I could show somebody how to mine them in a loving manner. So why not, why not do that? Wouldn't that cause... But I can't show somebody how to kill an animal in a loving manner. Right, but wouldn't it have a net more positive effect on the world? If you, if you could show people how to mine things in a loving way, why aren't you flying to the Democratic Republic of Congo and going out there and showing because them? Because nobody wants to know at this point. See, this is the problem. This is the problem with truth, as you know, Matt. Like, you know, I feel what you're trying to do now is you're trying to place uh, me in a position where you're trying to make it look like I'm hypocritical. But, but I feel it seems hypocritical to me. Oh, I'm not, I'm not I understand. Lie. I'm, I'm yeah, not I understand. And and what I'm saying to you is that people will only accept new truth when they want it. Right. That's the reality. So I'm saying the truth about eating meat, but there's many people who listen to me regularly who still eat meat. Right, but I'm asking why don't you then say the truth? Do you believe that what I just said to be the truth about mining, about the way these things are I do, and I've also said it on videos. So then why wouldn't you then demonstrate the truth to people by giving those things up? But giving them up isn't the answer. Showing them how to mine properly is the answer. Is it like you said you won't show them how to mine properly because they don't want to know. So is there a tautology no, no, again? No, no, see this is where I feel you're, you're not getting back to the logic of it. The reality is I can't show a person how to kill an animal humanely. I don't believe there is such a thing. Right? I believe that anything that results in death that is just for the point of my consumption. So it's not like helping the animal die just because it's in terrible amount of pain, I'm helping the animal die because I want to eat it. Right? That is a very selfish act. Right? And also it damages the animal, the life of the animal. 
So I, there is no way I can kill an animal and eat it without damaging the life of the animal. But there is a way I can mine without damaging anybody's life. Right. So, so from an ethical perspective, the ethics are, are, are different. I don't understand it. It seems illogical to me. I'm... I understand, but but you're, the reason why is because you don't see that that the life of the animal is a life. No, the, thing, the difference is that I see that the life of the miner is a life. I agree, but if the miner is able to be loved and cared for and looked after in the process of the mining, and the environment is about able to be, and it is. And we had less of a focus upon, you know, greed, and we had more of a focus on just loving the things that we get and loving the people who give them to us. Then all of those issues could be re relatively easily fixed if we didn't have a focus on economy. So, so I see the biggest issue that I must address it within my soul, my own soul. Now I'm talking about, is my focus on economy, like my focus on why I want things. That needs to be addressed. Now, if I want things so that I can help others understand more truth, then that's not a selfish act. If I want things so that I get popularity uh, or some other emotion, then that is a selfish act. What if you want them just so that you can enjoy them? Um, well, it's still a selfish act. No, I, so, I wouldn't... so then tell me, in what, what way does that 52-inch flat screen TV help you well, when we have, we actually have meetings here. The reason why we bought it is we have meetings here of about 30 people. I know that might be a bit hard to believe. They're coming at 2 o'clock. They're coming at 2 o'clock, actually. <laughs> and what we do is we present the outline of what we're discussing on the screen so that everybody can see it. And it was, a, it was the most economical way for us to present that to every single person and then also make changes as we we're doing it so that everybody could see it. That's why we bought it. Um, well, why not just use a whiteboard and then have somebody typing on a typewriter? Well, they, were well, they couldn't just type it on a typewriter nowadays. They have to type it generally on a computer. You can get a typewriter. I have no typewriter. Yeah, but see, now what you're doing is you're discussing like competing, uh, what are competing uses of, of energy and so forth. Well, no, all I'm discussing is that, it, because from my perspective as an outsider here, mm -hmm. it seems to me like you are, you are you want to be able to use technology because you enjoy it, which is a perfectly valid thing. I have no, my the, phone in my pocket. The main reason why we use technology, myself and Mary, the main reason why we use it is to distribute truth. We don't. I could say fairly categorically that neither of us actually enjoy it, but we do use it. We do use it. We avoided uh, using it at, at home um, because we prefer to go out and do things in the garden. And as, as you'll see, if, if we go for a walk, if we get time, um, we don't actually live in this area. We don't live we in this home, and um, laundry, but, we but we live in a tent um, down the back. We, what, we've try, what we're trying to do as a gradual process is to remove the footprint of our energy consumption, which I feel that everybody who's responsible on the planet should do. That's what we're trying to do. And I agree with you completely about that. There's a lot of good reasons to do that, uh, including the harm that it brings to the environment, but also the harm in particular that it brings to people. So I agree completely. I'm not arguing about that. Um, so I don't really see the point of the question in the sense, because already myself and Mary have taken many actions personally to remove the footprint of our energy consumption. But it's not just energy have you, consumption. Have you, Yeah, hugely. Yeah. Um, Do you have, how big is your house in, in the US? It's small. Oh, I don't have a house in the US. I have an apartment in right. Sydney. Yeah. It's about the size of this room, yeah. a little bit bigger. Yeah. Just one room, well, you know, and uh, yeah. sort of walled up. It's a loft. Yeah. Um, and I feel, so I, I feel. I drive a car, I walk yeah. wherever I go. Yeah. I'm pretty good, actually. But, but you have driven a car here, yes? Uh, yeah, of course. So when it supports your desire for more truth, you do use technology, hmm. and, and I'm exactly the same. So I don't see. How but I don't. I don't have to do. I guess I feel like you are. You're making logical backflips to try to justify something. Whereas I, I just admit that the world is an imperfect place. That we have to go places in cars, limit it when I can. But you know, I live in the world as we have it, and I try to be the change that I would like to see in the world because I think it's a very valid way to live. Which is exactly the same as what I do. Right, except that I think 
you were more extreme because you were, you know, saying so, that you'd keyed into. So what you're criticizing is that, the extreme extremity of me. No, no. Right? What, what I'm not at all. I think it's. Are you criticizing me just because I'm doing it more than you are, or are you criticizing me because I'm criticizing? I don't think I'm criticizing you. I think I'm questioning you. Uh-huh. And what I'm questioning is why you draw. Where, where you're drawing your lines, I see inconsistency, and I'm, I'm yeah, talking like, about times, but, but if you point out the inconsistencies, well, I think it's inconsistent for you to say, I don't eat meat because it harms animals, mm-hmm. but I will use a flat screen television or buy a flat screen television, knowing that. No, the reason why I don't eat meat it is that it always harms animals. It always harms them. But even even right I, back in the first century, it still harmed them. Now it still harms them, and no matter what, how we pre- how we improve technologically, it will continue to harm them. The difference between that and doing something with technology is that we don't have to continue harming everything. That's the main difference. And I see that as a major difference. You do not, obviously, so we disagree. I don't feel that's inconsistent. Do you think, I the, feel people who are, do you think the people who are harmed by it during those periods when we aren't doing it in an ethical way are just as valid as the animals who are harmed? Should more, be valid, more valid, to be frank. That's why myself and Mary have attempted to reduce our footprint. There was a time when I had 11 or 13 homes, right? And I've reduced all of that down. There was a time when I had cars that got rid of all of the cars. The only cars we have now are only to support the delivery of what we believe the truth to be, which is all about love. So the only time that we choose to use these things is about love. I do see a time in the future when we won't even do that. Does that make sense? Like, I do see that. And I do see this process of reducing the footprint of every single person on the planet as a major evidence that we are becoming more loving. I am not saying that I'm perfected in love, and I've never claimed that. But people believe that because I'm saying I'm Jesus, I must be saying that I'm perfected in love. And that's all to do with belief. I think what I I see, I see what you're saying, but what I, I see here is that I feel like you're not willing to accept perhaps that your position on this is just is is inconsistent with what you're saying well i I don't i think i've explained why my position is consistent but but i i can understand that you don't agree with that and that's up to you i I feel i've explained fairly clearly why my i feel my position is consistent i've also stated to you fairly clearly that that i would be uh, like in the process as we currently are reducing our footprint even further and, and so, you know, that, that's, what I, that's what I see. But I also see that the delivery of truth on the planet is very, very important. Uh, that's what I believe. Just like you believe your job is important, I believe what I have chosen to be as my job is important. And I believe that, that talking to people about love and, and the effects of love will have a gra- far greater effect to every single person on the planet than my stopping using one camera. So for example, if everybody who actually mined came and had a chat with me about how to ethically mine, I believe that would have a much greater effect on the planet than, uh, than my usage of one camera. But I, think the, I thought you said you wanted to be, the, and you advocated being the change that you want to see in the world. I agree. And that's what I'm doing. That's why we do seminars, because I'm being the change I want to see in the world. So don't you want to see the change towards people being more loving and having a more responsible relationship with technology? That's, that's what I hear you saying. Of course. That's exactly, that's, if everyone had the same relationship to technology that I currently have, my beliefs are that we would have a far better planet. However, uh, you know, that happening is only going to happen by me sharing the message that I'm preaching to the world. And the only method I've got to do that currently is through the current technologies that are available. And I do believe that we need to use the current technologies in order to discover the new ones. That's my belief. And historically, that has also been what has happened. We've had to use current technology before we've worked out what is good and what is not. And I believe that is a very important issue with regard to the planet. However, um, I just find it interesting how much you're laboring the point. Um, and it just, it's now just feeling like you just want to make a point score so that, so that you can somehow prove that I'm inconsistent. And you're allowed to believe that I'm inconsistent if that's what you wish. That's what I feel. I feel we don't need to discuss the matter any further. I believe my position has been stated carefully 
and and I do believe that in time um, there will be a very loving way in which to get the resources from the planet and to reuse the resources from the planet. I can take you on the on our property and show you how we're reusing resources that you are currently putting in garbage, and and so I'm not saying and so what I'm saying is that. I am already attempting to do many of these things in my private life. However, I feel the use of technology in our, in our life is very important if we are going to deliver the truth to the world. I can't rely on the media to do it because you're not going to do it honestly or ethically generally. Most people in the media so far have proven that to us. And so I have to take responsibility for myself doing it in some way. I feel like you're, you're getting angry with me. Are you getting angry with me? No, I'm just stating clearly to you what the truth is. Um, because I feel like you're, you're I'm, I'm definitely getting a sense that you're frustrated with me. No, I, I just feel like you would like to come into my own home without examining what I do with the rest of my life. You would then like to say to me that I'm being inconsistent without looking at your own inconsistencies in your own life. And on top of that, you then, and the only reason why you're doing it is to gain some kind of thing that you can write in a story. You're not doing it to really discover the truth or to have an open conversation with me about it. You're doing why it do for, you think that? Well, because I you're doing it for another reason. And it's like quite obvious. A pretty open conversation about it. I don't think that I'm going to get you to slip up and say something that. I'm not. It doesn't about. worry me if I slip up. To be frank, I feel that many people will make mistakes, and I will make them too. And I'm okay with making mistakes. I'm also okay with my life not being perfect, but I'm not okay with saying, oh, our life isn't perfect, so that doesn't mean I need to do as much as I possibly can to change it. And I'm saying to you that I am doing as much as I possibly can to change it, far more than the average person is on the planet currently. I am trying to do whatever I can do, to, because I love doing it, I am trying to do it so that things change. The reason why I talk about the meat issue is because there are 10 times the amount of resources used to produce the same amount of meat as it is to produce the same amount of vegetables. The reality is that millions of people on this planet die and their livelihoods are taken away from them just for the sake of production of meat. And, you know, we were just recently in Brazil and there's like, you know, so much of our livelihood of even fresh air being taken away from us there just for the production of meat. And so, I feel you can't ignore that one particular issue. I don't believe that I'm ignoring the issue of technology because I am reducing my technology, technological footprint as well. I don't believe I'm doing that. You may, it's up to you, but I don't believe I am. And I've stated that to you over and over in this conversation so far, and now like, it just feels like we're laboring the point, and that's what I'm saying to you. Does it bother you when people challenge you on these kind of things? No. Because I feel like that's all I'm doing. You know, I, I think I come from an intellectual tradition where mm. you talk things out and you, know, you, you point out. Yeah, but to talk things out, you have to emotionally be open to hearing what the person says and actually looking what's happening in their life. But I feel like of the two of us, you're, you're the one who's in this conversation right now about this, you are less emotionally open to hearing about it. I felt like no, you I'm seem saying, to be getting more frustrated and I'm, I'm perfectly happy, but you you seem to be shutting down a little bit and you're, you're, your demeanor is changing a little bit and you, you seem to be getting frustrated, which is okay, but I just want to know why that's happening. Well, I think the main probably reason why it's happening is because firstly, you're making sort of through your comments, you're trying to make accusations that are not being consistent. When, when, when I examine what we're doing, myself and Mary in our own life, we are being very consistent right across the board with all of these issues. Do you feel the same way, Mary? Yeah, yeah, I do. I feel that both AJ and I have an awareness that our life, as he said earlier, it will continue to change, our lifestyle will continue to change as we grow more in love and as we... We actually believe in the end that we probably won't even have a house or cars or technology or anywhere. We, we, the way we feel in the end will be, we'll probably just live in the bush, <laughs> um, is, the, is the way we feel it will go. We both of us have strong feelings about what happens in Africa um, and for example would never consider buying a diamond because we know how much suffering goes into the diamond trade. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's pointless aside from just something that looks pretty it, on a person. It doesn't even have a purpose to mine a diamond except for its um, sharpness <laughs> um, 
to wear it as jewellery is completely something that it's taking something from the earth's resources that doesn't need to come from it and it causes a lot of pain and suffering to not only that the industry is manufactured and kept at a high price by specific people in order to you know so so we sort of see those particular industries as industries that are highly exploitive both of us see that they're that one of the benefits of the age that we live in is that technology enables us to give this message to a lot of people for free very rapidly. Mm. And so, for example, we just travelled around the world and on the way home we both felt like, you know what, flying in aeroplanes, it doesn't feel good anymore. Mm. Like we just feel like we're using so many resources to do just this. Just to fly. So, um, but we do still want to share this message with the world and like you can do it really rapidly mm. by using technology and also there is the issue of truth like us wanting to be as transparent as possible to wanting to be as open to ensure that um, people have the opportunity to know what's really happening with us um, it's not really ever been my desire to be filmed very much but <laughs> that's, that's how life is turning out um, so as AJ points out, we're using things that have an origin that is actually could be mined lovingly. There is there is nothing wrong with using copper. You know, you could do it in a loving way. I mean, you could mine diamonds in a loving way also, <laughs> I suppose. Um, but diamonds don't help truth enter the world. And flying until... Except if they use for sharpening something. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to, trying to get it out. using precision tools of course. Just to cut the glass that goes into that. Of course. Yeah, exactly, of course. exactly. Uh, I'm but it's a lot less than what's currently mine. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. We also both drive. We have bicycles and we'd love to just be able to use them all the time, but it's really hard to go to a seminar. But even the t- making of a bicycle takes resources that, is, you, exactly. that all come from unloving processes generally. And we, I think we both agree that we are living in an imperfect world right now. But we are aiming for something that's more loving. Mm. And at the moment, we're using what we have around us. It would be different if we were buying a new camera every week just because it did one more function. You know, we don't believe or, you in... Or buying an iPod, iPhone just because it's an iPhone or... You know, because it does something flashy that... You know, the way that um, our world is in terms of consumerism, especially around technology, I feel is very... Um, self-centered and um, really based on just having like a new gadget and and people have come to expect that they should be able to have that. I think there's more to it than that though, that there's emotional connections that people have to the gadget because the gadget makes them feel involved in their life, like it makes them feel like life's busier and more interesting. Connected and and all of those things. And all these other things. So there's a whole, whole series I feel of emotional reasons why people do it. So, so I sorry. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so we don't have that kind of attitude towards technology. We use it when we have to. We use it with a lot of respect. AJ, because of his background, knows how to use it well. And, and how to care for it so it lasts a long time. And he's very particular about that. Like, I've learned a lot from him about how we can actually use technology in a broad range of senses, how it is to use a computer to make it function well and to last a long time and all of those things. So there's a value that we attach to these things. We're very thankful for these things. We use them consciously. Um, I know that doesn't change the situation for miners in Africa. And it doesn't sit well for me that 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 we're making that. um, But the reality is that the miners in Africa situation will change better if everybody stopped having such a consumer or or greedy attitude towards everything. And and the only way that's going to happen is people's hearts change. And the only way for people's hearts to change is for somebody to show them how their hearts can change. And that's what we're trying to do. So, So we see everything we're trying to do as a as a way of helping people adjust their life to change and 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 I feel like at times when when I get accused of inconsistencies like you did earlier I just feel like um, you're you're not seeing any of those things as important because because you don't believe that actually changing the heart of a person can actually happen I believe 
And, you know, if you actually believed that that was very important, then you'd have a different focus, perhaps. Um, whereas myself and Mary believe strongly that the, you know, Mary's lived in refugee camps a lot of her life. She, I've been involved with a lot of people personally in terms of their personal problems and things. And what we have observed is that unless the heart changes, the action doesn't change. So unless the heart changes, there will be no loving mining. Unless the heart changes, there will be no loving food production. Unless the heart changes, there'll be no loving politics. There'll be no loving religion. You know, there'll be no loving any endeavor on the planet. They all will remain in the condition of sometimes loving, sometimes not. If if we can help hearts of people change, which is our sincere desire, by just stating the truth of these things, then then we feel that these things can change very very rapidly. And we also believe quite strong. We, we don't have a belief, or I particularly don't have a belief, that it's hopeless. You know, that it's impossible. Um, Mary sometimes probably does have a feeling that it's hopeless or... Well, sometimes I feel overwhelmed by the condition of the world and the hearts of people and... Um, but um, I suppose you have to understand the way we view the soul and that is that if that emotion is in me, that is... I need only to be humble to that emotion, to actually experience that emotion. And which is what I've been doing for, for about four years. Um, well, I'm, I'm starting to now. I've carried that emotion for a lot of my life. And, um, and I feel much more hope as a result of, of allowing that grief that I've been carrying, which then becomes my hopelessness mm. about the condition that we're all in. This goes a little bit to um, your view of the future, I think. Um, and I've heard various sort of little bits and pieces, but you think that there is a change coming, that there's a tumultuous change coming in the next few years? Is that right? Um, well, the first thing is that I have a lot of hope for the future. Like, you know, I feel very positive about the future, particularly if people's hearts change. I also believe that if there are tumultuous events that occur on the earth, we have the ability as a human race to know about them in advance and therefore prevent any damage to a large degree of humans or, or, or animals and, and other things about these changes that, occur, that can occur. But I do feel, um, as many people do on the earth, that there are going to be coming changes to the earth as a result of how we're treating it. Um, and these changes will reflect to us that we need to change, you know, that we need to change what we do. And they only reflect it to us by actually, you know, a lot of times the human race doesn't change unless change is forced upon it by the earth itself, it appears. And, uh, and I feel historically there's plenty of evidence in the ice core and, and, other, and other evidences that these changes have occurred cyclically on the planet. And I believe that we're coming up for another one now. Um, so, so what do you think is going to happen and when do you think it's going to happen? Um, the when is much harder to answer than what. Um, the when is very difficult to answer because, it, is it, because it's, um, it's determined by the collective condition of fear on the planet. You know? So you're talking about the 7 billion people of people on the planet. And then I believe there's also around 22 or so billion spirits uh, who still are connected to the planet uh, in their spirit state. And all of these people have a large amount of fear generally in them that they obviously many of them are in denial of, but have a large effect on all of the systems of the planet. And, and so I feel those particular things are very hard to predict. So it depends on how people react in their fear as to how bad the damage can be. So, you know, this was the case during the 60s, if you think about it, like if, if, man, if, if the world leaders reacted in only in fear without any reason during the 60s, then we'd probably be living, if we possibly live on a nuclear wasteland at the moment, uh, if they'd taken, you know, those direct actions that they were considering doing. And it was only through the reason or the lack of fear on the part of some of those world leaders that, that we're not living in such a place. And so I feel it's the same decisions now, like we need to deal with and address our fears through these particular potential events that may occur. 
And I do believe that if we deal with it and address our fears, the potential events will also be lessened as a result. So in the 60s, if mankind had acted in fear completely, then we would probably, you and I would probably not be alive right now. Um, if the, uh, it, because there, there was some courage and some truth, and uh, then those choices weren't made, and then as a result, we have life still. And I sort of believe it's much the same now with these kind of events, except but what that they won't be... That, well, I don't believe they'll be man-created. I just believe the Earth goes through these cycles uh, every 15 to 17,000 years, and I believe we're coming up for another one. And, um, and I can't predict when. I, I wouldn't surprise me if it happens in the next year, to be frank. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if it happens in the next six months. Um, my personal attitude towards it is... I'm going to do the best I can up until anything that occurs to, to distribute as much truth about love as I possibly can. That's my personal. But more specifically, so you're talking about what, an, another ice age? Um, I don't believe there'll be another ice age myself. That's my, you know, I, I know there are people on the planet who do believe there will be such a thing. Uh, there are people who believe uh, in all sorts of theories about the change, that there'll be another ice age or so forth. In fact, I feel it, it may be, on an average, warmer than it currently is, but in a more tropical, uh, humid, humid way. But that's my personal opinion. I, I don't know for certain. But um, I do believe there is going to be major upheaval while the Earth changes, because there always is. There, there are historical records during these times of the Earth's axis tilting in its rotation. So. The Earth's spinning around it currently at about a 22 and a half degree axis, and there is historical records of, a, of of that axis of rotation changing, and the magnetic fields changing at some point in the in history. And if those particular events happen, then of course there will be some quite like large upheaval type events occurring to the Earth itself, which will affect most people on the planet. And, and I believe they can potentially happen at any time. That's my belief. I don't believe there's anything to fear about them, but, uh, and in fact I encourage people to, to address their fears about them, um, because I believe there are a lot of what I would classify as, what do you call it when there's uh, conspiracy type of uh, mm. theories about all of it and so forth, but, um, but, but I, so I don't believe in, there's any need for any fear or anything like that about it. Mm. What do you think is going to happen to so, I mean, do you, are you talking about the end of sort of Western civilization as we know it, in terms of governments breaking down and... I believe that in some countries there will be anarchy, certainly, just like there is anarchy right now in some countries that, you know, obviously when people are under a lot of stress and they don't know where their next food's coming from or their water's coming from or other things that might occur, then people can slip into anarchy type of... Uh, I guess I'm just trying to gauge... Um, the level of tumult that you see, because when you talk about cyclical changes, like they're having, you know, like well, if, every if you look at these cyclical years. changes that have occurred, every one of them that's occurred every sixteen thousand years or so has been quite a large change to the planet. That's what I mean. Yeah. So, so you but know, that's one being the, yeah, the massive ice age. You know, yes, and rendered. you know, there's records in the fossil records of you know, even. Uh, animals being snapped frozen even while they're eating grass and so forth mm. and I believe these kind of potential events are potentially uh, going to happen during this cyclical change um, and that would render a lot of the world's I mean these last events the, the previous ones have rendered huge areas of the earth uninhabitable well there's already huge areas of the earth that are uninhabitable but but, um, but most of the northern hemisphere in the last is age. yeah yeah no I understand um, I don't feel that the events will have the same effect this time as the last time. That's my personal opinion. I, I may be wrong. As I said, um, there's a lot of things that I may be wrong about at this point, and I don't claim to be all-knowing, and I'm certainly not at one with God in what I talk, teach people about the condition of being at one, in God, um, at one with God. I still have fears within me. I still have some anger within me. I still have some sadness within me that I need to address these particular things stop me from understanding God's perspective of what will actually occur, I believe. Um, 
However, I can make, uh, if I'm asked the question, what is my opinion, I'm happy to give it at, at, at any one point in time. But I'm not, uh, but what you in the media generally do is you take the opinion that I give today and then you say that that's my continual opinion. No, no, I just want to know what your opinion is today. Yeah. No. Oh, well, if you're asking for what my opinion is today, my opinion is today that it would not surprise me that within the next six months some of these big cyclical events will occur. I feel that there will be, you know, there potentially could be one third of the Earth's inhabitants because we're all so close to the water in the way we live our lives and our cities and everything, uh, potentially one third of the Earth's inhabitants could pass during these events. That's my particular feeling today. Um, I believe that all the events uh, that can potentially occur um, if we became more aware of, what, of the Earth and we gave the scientists who are looking at the Earth far more resources than giving the scientists that are looking at destroying the Earth the resources. Um, so for example, instead of, instead of spending a third of our budgets on, or half of our or, uh, you know, in some cases a third of the economy of, of some Western civilizations are based on arms manufacture. Instead of putting all that resource into, you know, the destruction of people on the planet, then if we put some of that resource in, into understanding the planet and uh, helping the scientists who are looking at the planet to understand the planet better, then I feel that we would be able to not only forecast the events but also, uh, you know, have the scientific evidence and proof uh, available that people would be convinced to actually move away from dangerous areas rather than continue to live in them. So you don't think that we could, or that it would be wise to try to stop the events from happening themselves? You just think you, people need to be better informed and live in a more sustainable way and not live in places that aren't, that people shouldn't be living like along all the coastlines and that kind of thing? Or do you think that we could actually stop these things from happening with enough scientific expertise? Uh, I'm not sure about that question, to be frank. If we had enough scientific expertise and enough scientific knowledge, then potentially we might have ways that we can resolve these particular events and not have them regularly occur. But obviously, historically, um, they have regularly occurred, you know, uh, for, for many thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, at least, that we know of. And, and so, and, uh, you know, there's the potential that they'll continue to regularly occur unless we know how to stop them. I do not believe we're ever going to know how to stop them while we're investing so much resources in the destruction of the Earth mm -hmm. and very little resources sources into the preservation of it. I also don't believe that we'll be able to stop them easily without changing our condition of love towards the Earth. Like so. I believe while we have such a raping attitude towards the Earth, um, we can't really, you know, stop a lot of these events. And the third thing that concerns me about the events in the sense, when I say concern, you know, I suppose is more a statement. The thing that um, I think about the events is that it's hard for man to stop a minor event now. Like, you know, if you think about the average earthquake stopping the earthquake, uh, you know, man hasn't even considered how to do that at this point. You know, if you look at the potential of, well, you know, just last week there was a few earthquakes in Costa Rica, right, 7.3 or 7.6. You know, if man looked at how to stop such events, um, the amount of force in such events is so high, you'd have to consider how we could ever stop them. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of technological development we need to make if we're going to ever consider stopping them. Um, but we're not going to make that technological development if we continually sit back and say we can't affect anything positively. But you're saying, I mean, you wouldn't be surprised if this happens within the next six months. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be, it seems to me... In my current, you know, that's how I currently feel. Right, today. Mm -hmm. That it would be virtually impossible, even if we shifted all of our industries or all of our scientists from those industries towards industry. I mean, just developing the tools you would need to do that would take more than six months, it would take years. Yeah, I don't know, like, you know, there are a lot of tools already available uh, to us that we are just utilising in different directions. Mining is one of them, you know, we utilise a lot of tools that we would be utilising for the discovery of what happens to the planet, um, to take things from the planet. And the reason why we do that is because we're invested in the economy of it. You know, we, we're invested in what money it makes us all. Right, no, I, I hear that, but I mean, actually, realistically, 
the kind of, you know, even we understood quite a bit about nuclear, um, you know, fission before the, the yeah. bomb, advent of the bomb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it took, you know, five years for the Manhattan Project just to develop the tools to build the bomb. The bomb that is, you know, today, it's a nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and that isn't anywhere near, or I'm sorry, the, you know, that isn't anywhere near as complex as what we would need to do to mm -hmm. stop. So, I mean, I guess, Mike, I mean, what would you do? Well, do you think, I guess I'm asking you whether you think really it is possible to change at this point or whether we should just be dealing with the fallout from the events in, in, a, in a helpful and... Well, it, you're right, like at the end of the day, um, although, you know, when I, when I think about it, we've got 7 billion people on the planet, many of these people are very clever, and many of the people are using the, the resources of the planet in a direction for the economy. Many very clever people are frustrated about the lack of funding for what they believe are very important projects that would help mankind. And um, I do believe that if if there was a definite shift in focus between, you know, investing in the destruction to investing in the, uh, I suppose you could say, the sustainability of the planet, um, that we could very rapidly discover things that we're currently not discovering. So, so. I believe six months of time we could easily discover where these events would occur, for example. Does that make sense? Sure. Like where they would potentially occur. Now once we know where and we have a large degree of scientific evidence available to us to know where that can be presented to the public, then we can talk to the public about how to move from those locations so that their life is sustained. And I don't know if anybody will do that because the, the reality unfortunately is on the planet, as you know that most people want to stay where they are and want to deny that anything might happen to exactly where they are. They, they like to believe that it will always be somewhere else. And I feel, feel that's a lot about fear again. Like, you know, we're so afraid of change that we resist change even when the evidence is right, they're hitting us in our face that we should change. And so I believe there's these potentials, but I don't know whether that will come about. I don't, sure. you know, they may not. But what I am saying is that even if these events occur, we firstly have the ability right now to at least predict them. We have the ability right now, given our resources, to discover where they may occur, where, what are the hot spots, if you like, of the planet and where certain dangers lie. We have the ability to educate people, to help them work their way through those particular issues so that they can move away from those particular places. And we have the ability to actually have quite a lot of change and assist people through that process. But I doubt whether we're going to do it because because the reason why is that we we don't like to tell anybody something that seems to be bad news, and the reason why we don't like doing that is because people often respond angrily to bad news, particularly bad news that may not happen. Mm. And so what they do is that you know they act in their fear, thinking that it might happen, and then when it doesn't happen, they get all resentful, right? Now, in a society that's more loving, we wouldn't do that. We, we would understand that science is a process of experimentation. And if scientists have decided that there's a 90 degree of, you know, 90 percent possibility that something will happen in this particular location, then we are at least informed. That's mm -hmm. my opinion. Uh, that's well, what are we places do. like the property that Rob and Angela are developing connected with your belief that tumultuous events are going to happen? No, they're connected with my belief that we need a place or we need locations, pe people who are willing to develop locations that are, um, that are like a centre of learning for humanity to come to to learn about the soul. And that's the whole reason why I've encouraged people, if they desire, have the desire to set up these centres, to set them up. All myself and Mary do is advise these people. Um, we don't have a day-to-day -day interaction with the property, but um, we've encouraged them to set up such properties just like we're trying to do with our own property so that they can be places where people can come to learn things and to learn things in a practical way, not just a theoretical way. And so, you know, that the now I don't know what their particular motivation is, aside from knowing Rob and Ange well enough to know that they have a strong desire for people to want change, you know. And uh, I don't believe Rob and Ange are afraid of any coming earth change events or anything like that. I feel they have a very strong motivation 
of wanting to have truth on the planet. So she seemed certainly focused on the fact that there was going to be an earth change. I mean, she seemed oh. a little stri- not I don't want to say stressed out, but she seemed it was certainly present. I mean, I had a conversation with her that was only what fifteen minutes, ten minutes long. Yeah, and in it, she said, you know, quite clearly, yeah, things are going to get pretty bad next, you know, a couple she's, of years. And she's believed that. Uh, most of her life, I believe. Um, before we met Ange and Rob, she had uh, she's felt that for many, like I think for even twenty years or so. She she's you know she before we met her, she had been involved in the past in storing food. She doesn't do that now, but she she's like you know all these kind of things. So I believe there is probably quite a lot of fear in Ange about that particular issue. For her to have such a long involvement with that issue, um, myself and Mary don't store food. We don't. Uh, we're not even worried about whether we have a veggie garden ready or not, you know, or anything like that. We're just focused on living our day-to-day life in the way that we believe we need to, um, and that's what we encourage them to do. However, we do see that every single person who hears us does take certain things we say, and because of their own belief systems, feel quite you know, connected to those particular things. And I'm sure Ange feels probably connected to that particular particular belief. And um, I've often said to her, what happens if it doesn't happen, Ange? Are you still going to do this? You know, what happens if there is no earth changes? Are you still going to do this learning centre? And and she says, yes. So, so I feel she's following her desires in a much more pure way than just responding to her own fear. But... But the reality is, um, yeah, there are people who are in fear about what I've said about all sorts of things. There's a lot of parents in fear about what I've said about parents and children's, uh, um, you know, sicknesses, for example. There's a lot, but but that can't stop me from just saying the truth about them as I believe it to be. And if I believe, if I feel something different at any point in time, then I'll say differently. Um, And I've also told people that they cannot assume that everything I've said is accurate, and I've told this and said this over and over again, they cannot assume that everything I've said is accurate, they need to analyse it for themselves, which is what God has given them their intellect for, and also given them their emotional condition for. But they can't analyse things very accurately while they're living in fear. They need to work their way through the fear to actually analyse things accurately. But um, So, yeah, there's probably people who we know now who have a strong, who the only reason why they're here is because they're worried about potential earth changes. And, it, and my comments to them have been, if that's the only reason why you're here, you shouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. You should be somewhere else doing what you desire to do. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place maybe to stop for today so you don't get too sick of me because no, I'm going to hang out with you again next that. weekend, I hope, and yeah. talk about some more stuff. Yeah. Um, and I know... I reckon Andrew's probably going to want to take a couple of pictures of you before we go, and then we kind of. Do you want to just plane. take a few pictures of the property as well, Andrew? Well, well, like, we don't actually live here; we live in a tent down at the oh, back. Really? And, yeah. I'd love to. Is it far from here? No, no, no it's a, to walk is uh, a, Yeah, it's three hundred metres. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Yeah. I mean, yeah. really, what I'd love to do is just um, follow you in, around in whatever it is you're doing, and just observe you and. You know, if Ines were doing or if... Um, uh, I can't do it now because I've got two o'clock. We've got another two o'clock. We've got a two o'clock meeting coming up. So okay. with a group coming, which will probably be here in the next half an hour or so. So, um, yeah, so... so, but, but I can take you for a little walk if you want. Yeah, if, if yeah. that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's fine. Okay. Yeah.